lunch. You are looking live. Live at lunch. Live at lunch with Ott and Hanny on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. What the hell's going on out here? Now, here's Jimmy Ott and Charles Hanegriff. Yeah, for some reason or another, you sound a little taller on radio. Is it, is it, is it live? Is it, is it, is it live? Is it live? From Rafino's on Highland Road, welcome to the Friday edition of Live at Lunch, 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. I'm Charles Hanger, along with Richard Dixon. Max Gotro is here. Jordan Kitchens back in the studio. Jimmy Otto join us in a little while. It is Log of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris and Edward Jones Investments, and it is LSU's final off weekend of the regular season. Rich, good morning. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. How do you feel? Uh, th- this part of the season... It's always been the buy for better than a decade now, but it was always um, the you know the first well usually is the first buy, and it was going to Alabama, which some of those years was everything and was always important. How you feel this year compared to other years? Because I've got some thoughts on it. Uh, I mean, look, multiple buys is, I think is always good just to get your body rested, get feeling good, uh, get the little mental break from the grind on it. I think it's tough coming off a, a tough loss to A&M. Like, I think I said it in the post game, you know, Saturday night. It makes for a long two weeks when you have a bye week after a loss. Can that be good? Uh, can it, it fester in? Uh, can it uh, crystallize focus, if you will? Um, I mean, you. I think you spend a little bit of extra time on what went wrong, and which you know sometimes mentally it sucks because you're like you still got to think about it, but you can you do have extra time to go figure out what went wrong, why it went wrong, and how, how to fix it. You know, that, I think that seems particularly important this week because what was one of the, the reasons, we talked about the reasons that LSU uh, lost the game, the turnovers. Well, you're always going to work on that. The running game, well, you're always going to work on that. Running quarterback and the amount of time they put in on that has been a big topic. Yeah. And, I, and I, think it's, I think it's actually been a l- overblown a little bit. But if you were going to play – this week against Texas, okay, with a quarterback that doesn't run, or Let's Georgia with a quarterback that no, <laughs> <laughs> well, the other quarterback that yeah. doesn't run or doesn't run a lot anyway. Um, are you going to play Georgia, whose quarterback really doesn't run either? But you have played two running quarterbacks in a row, the two quarterbacks that can really hurt you with your feet, and against Taylor Green, they did a terrific job. No. Mississippi State did not against. Texas A&M, you didn't know what to do with Marcel Reed. Well, Jalen Milrow is as dangerous with his legs as any quarterback in the league. So maybe that festering of, man, look, we didn't do a real good job at all of containing him, is pertinent this week with Milrow on the on the horizon. Yeah, I mean, look, if you go back and watch what we did on YouTube Monday. Um, the very first touchdown by Reed – was just blown up. They did. They did not cover it well. They did not have the guys in the right spot. It was his first play in the game. First play in the game. Yeah. Um, the next two, they they read it. I mean, they had guys going the right directions. It was just misfits. You had two guys in one gap. It, it was it was similar to things we saw early on in the year when you know guys what well, they said got too many guys were trying to make too many plays or you know they weren't just doing their part of the defense their role their job and uh that's where the the mistakes in the big play especially the 20 20 yard run everybody read the pullers everybody flew to where the ball was going but they just got to the wrong spot he's tough to tackle yeah not that he's a big burly kid but he's slippery and on that particular play when he got when he got 20 it looked like he got skinny in that. It, yeah. it, it, it was not a gaping hole. It appeared, but when you see it from the end zone view, it's like, wow, okay, it's not like this is a hole that's, you know, three splits wide. It's just he slithered through that thing in a hurry, and both of you guys had over-pursued. Yeah. So when you're talking about run fits, that's – this is a – how much does it – how much did it look to you I, – I, I know you've gone back and looked at it again because you're a sick individual. You – uh how much did it look like the bus against South Carolina? Very similar. Yeah. I mean, guys that were – they read the play right. They knew where the ball was going. They just didn't fit the right holes. They didn't They didn't play their job exact. Yeah. This is what's different for me this year. Um, every year since the BCS started, really, the uh, the second loss was the one that was kind of the knockout punch. Not always. Not for us. In 07, 
it, it, it worked out. But that was the only year yeah. it worked out like that on the national scene. And in 2001, it was a fun ride to the SEC championship because they hadn't had one in 15 years, hadn't won the Sugar Bowl in three decades. And so even with the third loss, that, w- that was a fun end to the season because they got on a little bit of a run. The Auburn game was in December because of 9-11, and everybody was in, you know, really locked in. The rest of the seasons after the second loss, there's been mostly a letdown. Now, last year, a little bit because of Daniels. Yeah. And you had – you felt like, okay, if they could have beat Alabama and, you know, snuck into the SEC championship game, who knows? Do they beat Georgia? Almost certainly not. Yeah. But maybe. Who knows? Maybe they, maybe they could have beat them 56 to 55. Who, who knows? Um, this year's different. This year has two losses – but I feel like not only is everything on the table for LSU, everything's still in their, uh, in within their uh, their command. You know, they control their own destiny, and I I don't know that they ever have with two losses. They've mm-hmm. always needed some help. Somewhere We've never else. had a twelve team playoff. I never mean, had a twelve team playoff. We, we, we never had these. Had never had divisionless. Losses. You know, yeah. the SEC. Well, yeah. and, and I think there was a stat earlier. Um, I can't remember exactly who said it, but it was the first time in however many years that every SEC team had a loss going into November. Wow, I didn't think about that. Um, yeah. I mean, so it's, it's the most 07, parody. right? Uh, I think it was 07. 07, yeah. They said it has been so many years since every SEC team had a loss going into November. You had a 12-team playoff to it. I think the parity of the league's there to where, it, you know, you, you lost, the USC loss just looks worse and worse. But you know what? This team is not the team that they were there. They're, they're completely different. Um, the defense is night and day. Um, this, then this is where I'm feeling comfortable because the defense is getting better. This, the, the last quarter and a half of the A&M game was disappointing because we had seen this defense come. But, look, I'm tired of putting that all on the defense and defense coordinators and the preparing for the running quarterback because they had three touchdowns where they, they had started on the eight-yard line, the 20-something yard line, a 30-yard line. They, they drove the field, scored three touchdowns without going over 70 yards. Yeah. So there, there's things that um, I'm still confident about. I think that, uh, you know, there's things that can fix. And then, like you said, I mean, you can control your own destiny going on. You know, Surprisingly enough, the, the path to the SEC championship game is a little bit easier or a little bit clearer with even with two extra teams in the league now because there's no divisional play. Yeah. If we were still in divisional play, LSU would need A&M to lose twice, unless there were a three-team tiebreak and we get all that. But you've now got a, a, a very clear path. You own the, own a couple of the, the, the multi-team tiebreakers, yeah. strange as, as, as that would be. I, I think that there is some poetic justice to the idea that Texas would lose a tiebreaker because of the schedule that they were – if Jimmy were here, he would say awarded uh, or, or gifted. You know, uh, th- there's there's a little bit of justice to that. If it gets there, we we don't. The la- the, the next time all the chalk holes in November will be the be the first time. So I don't want to get too far down the line with that uh, yet. But it, at least it's it is on the table, and you're you're there with uh, you're, you're there with Alabama, who's basically in the same boat that yeah. you are. Um, you know, one of their losses is not non-conference the way LSU's is, but they feel like if they can, you know, win out and get themselves in this conversation and have a break or two fall their way, that they can get there. They could also lose multiple games yeah. in, in November. LSU could lose multiple games in November. You know, we thought that uh, LSU would be a favorite in Tiger Stadium. We actually saw that Alabama opened up uh, a small favorite in the the outlets that have it out right now. I'm expecting a little bit of buyback maybe a picket by the time the game kicks off. But at least you're not this overwhelming underdog that We're, we're talking were. about running quarterbacks. I mean, who would you take right now in neutral field, A&M or Alabama? If I had to play A&M or Alabama on a neutral field right now, who would I feel LSU's more comfortable beating? Who? Boy, that's a good question. I mean, it's tough because we're, we're talking so much about – look, A&M, and it, it sounds – terrible and then we got we lose by double digits they were terrible for two and a half quarters i mean with with the other quarterback with wegman in i mean the, the offense was atrocious um if wegman we, plays the rest of the game lsu wins oh, by far, even with the turnovers they win with the turnovers um and i think you know you can play the devil's advocate 
when, I, when we went back and showed you the film from the first quarter and the holes they had on the left side, we ran for over 24 yards on our second drive of the game. And then throughout the rest of the game, we lose. We end up with 24 for the whole game. So there's a lot of things that just happen in that game that are, that are confusing. I'm trying not to dodge your question, even though I don't really want to answer it, uh, because <laughs> it's, it's hard. Um, Marcel Reed had such an enormous impact on this game, and they won other games with him as a starting quarterback. But it's not like he was the dominant player in all of those games. You know, he had a very uh, a, a very average game against Arkansas. I, I think you spend 90% of your time practicing for Marcel Reed and you take away what he did great, the game gets a lot tougher. Oh, well, now, hang on. Now, now you're going to go back to the they didn't prepare for him. Uh, well, you know, deal, deal. I didn't want to go there, um, but – Kelly didn't dodge it when they asked in the interview. He, said, know, he, interv- he, he, he said that, you know, we it. practiced it all year. Um, you know, we, we had this plan. That's, we, our guys just didn't do the roles, which, okay, you just said everything, but we did not practice it this week. Um, and we've seen what they did with Green. I thought Green is a better thrower. Um, after watching Reed run, I don't think he's a better runner. I mean, they're both very good, but <laughs> Reed, Reed was moving. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I think that if you spend all your time, and like I said during the post game. You spend 80 to 90% of your time on the starter and 10% of the time on a guy that might get in. You flip that role and you spend 90% of your time preparing for Reed and 10% on a, on a Wegman, I think it's, it's a better outcome. Well, put your Shane Beamer hat on. What you, uh, how would you have run practice at South Carolina this week? Oh, I'm, I'm worried about Reed the whole time because Wegman's terrible at throwing the ball too. Yeah. So you would, you would prepare – that I'm Reed was going to be the most the, dangerous thing to happen. Yeah, you know. but you, but let's say Reed goes in there, and it it it's not again, it's not a lock that he's going to run up and down the field the way he did against LSU. I mean, he had 13 yards against Arkansas. He had 40 yards in the. Well, I thought the McNeese came out. Um, he did run very well against Bowling Green, uh, and he ran well against Florida, but he's. Not a lock. No. Uh, you know, it's not like, oh, this guy's unstoppable. He's Michael Vick or, you know, he's Lamar Jackson or something like that. What if they go in and South Carolina has spent the whole week worried about him running, doing exactly what, you know, we've been talking about all week. So, hey, man, look, I'm putting eight people up in the front. If you throw the ball over my head, good luck. What if they do that? And you look up in the second quarter, and you have an- I think this week's more of a 60-40. Okay. You know, not, not an 80, 20, 90, 10. I think it's a 60-40 um, because I think it's easier to adjust to the passing game than it is to adjust to a quarterback with that skill set. Because we, it, it's easy to say just based on our familiarity, our, our recency bias, no. that Reed's great and Wegman's terrible. Well, that wasn't the case against Missouri. Wegman was great, and Reed didn't even need to play until the, the, the end when the game was, was out, of, out of reach. They went through a camp. Wegman won the job. Yeah. They, for most, with the exception of two quarters last week, they've thought that Wegman was the better quarterback. So if, if they get off, to, this game is fascinating to me, by the yeah. way, South Carolina uh, and, and A&M. I'm watch this weekend. It, it, it's fascinating to me because of the quarterback situation at A&M, how South Carolina is going to attack it, and – a&M has never been in the, this deep since they got into the league with, you know, the, the crown, you know, the, 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 the lead, this is the, most the pressure. pressure. Yeah, yeah. They, they have, they've never had to deal with that. Ole Miss didn't handle it very well no. <laughs> earlier in the year. You know, when you've never been there, it's, uh, it, it's a tough thing. When you start feeling like you can't make a mistake. And that, you're not playing free. You're not playing loose. You're playing to where don't make the mistake. The pressure just builds on you. Every play seems a little bit harder. And that's why I come back and say if LSU's got to win a game next week on a neutral field and my, my choices are play A&M or play Alabama, I'm probably still going to play, play A&M. I think my chances are better to win that game than they are to, but- uh, to, to beat Alabama. I'm going to prepare for both quarterbacks this time. Yeah, right. I mean, don't be ridiculous. That's but. all I wanted to hear. Like, I think this Alabama game is going to be a tough game. I feel more comfortable about LSU beating A&M, even after the fiasco we just had last week, 
than you know Alabama. Alabama for LSU is still the mental hurdle. It's beating Alabama. We're, we're, everybody's talking about Alabama. They got two losses, and we're still worried about Alabama. I mean, it's a uh, it's a, this quarterback beat us last year uh, with a, a terrible our de- bad defense. Last terrible year. was fine. Yeah, yeah terrible that, was fine. That, that word. Yeah. Um, but it I mean this is another game that is it is tough, and I I, I guarantee you they're not you know, overlooking it. I mean, this is a game that they're thinking is just as tough as any other year. Well, uh, they should. I, I certainly hope that they do because it is still Alabama, and th- this season is going to look drastically different uh, with a win here versus a loss. Yeah. It just is. And not for nothing, it's going to look way different in Tuscaloosa. They lose a third game, and they go into the Iron Bowl with basically, you know, playing for the ReliQuest Bowl or the whatever bowl then it's not going to be a pleasant offseason for Kalen DeBoer. It's probably not going to be anyway. But, the, you know, LSU can, can kind of trigger that. What gives me the most confidence is where they're playing the game. Yeah. Playing the game in Tiger State. If they're playing the game in Tuscaloosa, I'd be like, mm, okay, this is going to be like pulling teeth. I give them a great chance in this stadium. I, that, that's – if that's not number one on my list of optimistic things about the rest of the season, it's pretty damn close to the top that three of the four games are in Tiger Stadium. I thought, didn't you have a stat about Kelly after a loss? I th- there's a pretty good stat about the bounce back, how how often he wins, the percentage he wins. I can look it up during the break. No. I, I don't have it off the top of my head. Yeah, he's been you know he he's been pretty good with with that stuff. He's been he, the. The, the stat that always stands out with him is beat the teams you're supposed to beat. Yeah. He's won an outlandish percentage of his games as a favorite. Mm-hmm. But right now they're not a favorite against Alabama. They might be by the time they kick the ball. But Monday they'll swing some things. They're not for the moment. We're here at Rafino's Restaurant. Opens at 11 a.m. Appetizer features today the scallops with the blood orange beret. You know, you can do blood orange anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order it. Eggplant Mary with another one of my favorite appetizer features here. These are the eggplant medallions with the lump crab meat on the top and mushrooms with hollandaise sauce. It is a generous portion for an appetizer. I can uh, promise you that. Entree features include the grilled sea bass with the beer and bacon braised rainbow shard from the Dry Age New York Strip. And the uh, the dessert feature, this is... Uh, the spooky dirt custard, mocha custard, Oreo crumbles, and pistachio uh, thrown in there. Can't go wrong here at Rafino's. Come on out uh, and see us for lunch. This is Live at Lunch, Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. It's Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Where you can always get the show on demand, the new LouisianaSports.net plus uh, 104.5 ESPN.com. Uh, handicast we dropped on Monday. You want to go back and look at the plays that uh, Richard and I looked at against Texas A&M. You can do that. Rich, when did you, uh, when did you start playing organized football? Eight years old. Eight years old. Okay. You were a receiver, uh, running tight back. end. I was run- a running back until 10th grade. Okay. So you handle the ball yeah. a, a lot in your career. You ever get coached to not drop the ball before goal line? Uh, yeah. You did? I've been yelled at about it, before, okay. especially reaching out, doing all that stuff. No, no yeah. okay. Re- reaching out is a whole different thing. I'm talking about by yourself, going into the end zone, Drop the ball. You're told as a little kid, hand the ball to the referee. Yes. Score the touchdown, hand the ball to the referee. Okay. So you got you got coached up. Yeah. At what age? Eight, nine, ten. At what age did they stop coaching you to do that? At what at what point were you expected to just know that? Probably your senior year of high school, college. Okay. So you get to the NFL, you're kind of expected to know that, right? I can't. I can't get over it. The we, we've watched now two plays in the last week, three days. Uh, well, five days. Okay, where these guys have just freely given up the football before scored, and it's not like you know we we haven't seen this before. We saw it in the <laughs> Oregon Washington game last year that was in college, and I was telling Max when we were riding over here today, um, the first time I ever saw this play was in the Superdome, and you'll never guess who did it if you don't don't know the answer to this. 
Guy caught the ball on his way to the end zone. Nobody near him. Spikes the ball on the one-yard line. This is before replay. So the touchdown counted. It was Jerry Rice. Uh, Jerry <laughs> Rice spiked the ball on the one-yard line. I think he was in his second year. This would have been about 85 or so. And I was in the Superdome. I was a teenager watching and going, Why the, blah, 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 blah. wait. And he wasn't. He was a great player at that point, but he wasn't Jerry Rice yeah. yet. You know, he was still early in his career. It's, it's hard to remember now, but Rice actually had a few struggles. He had a really bad play in the Meadowlands against the Giants. Anyway, um, he spikes the ball in one yard line, and they looked at it on the TV cut and everything, and they watched. It's like, yeah, man, Jerry Rice spiked the ball in the one yard line, but there was no replay mechanism to overturn it, so yeah. he got it. Well, now. You know, they're going to get you. And it's not just, you know, this guy who's touching the ball for the second time in his pro career, Curiel, last night, uh, whatever his name is. The uh, Some of the best players we, we've seen do this. Tyron Matthew, one yeah. of the greatest players ever to come through LSU, got away with one yeah. in the Georgia Dome, you know, on the way on. So I was just curious when they, when they stop, you know, because to me at some point you, you quit – coaching at it's like teaching you how to put your shoulder pads on at some point you just got to know it's almost like you know they don't they allow college players to celebrate a little bit more now we weren't allowed to celebrate so you're always taught right hand the ball to the referee yeah. hand the ball to the referee because you might get a penalty you throw it you do anything you're going to get a penalty hand the ball to the referee um but i've also seen like you do crazy things when you have high emotions, and it is so hard to get in that end zone. And guys just overreact. Well, I would excited. think that that would be more incentive to hold on to the ball. Uh, you know, know. I'm finally going to get in the end zone. And Don't then they just the think they thing. made it, and they just—it's—it's it's dumb. I hate it, but I, I get where you're coming from. And it how ha- and how it didn't. Usually, when those type of things happen, it always always comes back to bite you, but I, I guess I shouldn't say that because it didn't bite the 49ers that day. They beat the Saints, and it didn't bite LSU when Matthew did it. They won the game, and the Jets ended up winning last night, but I'm just like, you know, I, at, at what point do you have to just a, assume certain things like, you know, carry the ball over the goal line? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. It's, well, it's very simple, and uh, like I said, 90 90- Nine percent of the time they do it, but I don't know why there's still that one percent. I, I I don't I, I don't get it. Your your dad uh, has been uh, a not a I don't think he, did he ever coach you coach you, but no. I mean not like he wasn't a coach on staff, but he, he has coached wa- you your whole life, right? He watched it practice and he told me what I needed to do at home. Yeah, if you spiked the ball on the one yard, I dropped the ball on the one yard line. I'm guessing what you would have got from dad would have been worse than what you would have got from the coach. I'd have walked home. He yeah. wouldn't put. He wouldn't let me in the truck. I, it blows my mind. I, I mean, this is the the basketball equivalent is shooting at the wrong goal. The baseball equivalent is going to the plate and putting your foot on home plate to bat. I mean, this is such a basic thing. Yeah, it's a, and it's frustrating. Um, like you said, back in the day, you could they didn't have the camera. That's that's hard to catch when you're running as, as fast as those guys are. Now, did you watch the game last night? No, did, did I watched see, the okay. Tuling game. I oh, okay. That. I. I'm watching the game in real time, and he scores, and I'm like, he dropped the ball. And, and I, I already know what's going to happen. They're going to have to go and get the Sapruder film out. And they're going to have to go frame by frame to see if when he releases, if the, the nose of the football gets over the line before he drops it. I'm going to tell you how bad it is that they actually coach what to do in that scenario to the rest of the team now. Like, we're always taught if you're trailing, trail your guy, and if the ball's dropped, pick it up. Yeah, I mean, when it's such a problem to your point that they're teaching the other guys, hey, just in case he drops the ball, pick it up. This is so aggravating to me. I planned on asking you one question and getting back into the LSU stuff, and here we burned a whole segment <laughs> on it because it's that <laughs> aggravating to me. This is the kind of stuff that, if I were a coach, uh, there's certain things that I would, and I'm going to ask you about your, your personal experience. You put a film together that you show in training camp of all of these things that might happen one time in uh, in a year, okay? Uh, bizarre plays, what you know, uh, what we're going to do uh, on a, a safety inside of two minutes when we got an onside kick no. after a safety, or th- these things that might happen once every five years. And I put this in that category. And after that, you know, you kind of, you got you to gotta own it. I'd put together a, 
a collage of all of the ones that had happened over the last five years. You've got enough evidence here. I mean, you can use for I'm going to show that film once, and I'm going to say, okay, after this, this is how stupid this is. This is how much it could cost your team, and you have to do this. But after that, I'm kind of done talking about it. And you if, after to. that, you have, to, you have to take the responsibility when I was yourself, LSU, right? We had that film before the season, and we yeah. went through that one. There was also another what one. Was on, what was on that film? What we had the, a, a guy dropping it before. Um, like I said, no celebration. So I'm trying to remember if it was Kansas or somebody. The quarterback, last play of the game, runs into the end zone with it, holding it out. And yeah. right when he crossed the line, he threw it up in the air and celebrated with his team. Without celebration, they flagged him, moved him back. Then they missed the extra point. They lose the game. So yeah. there, there was other things like that, that just um, dumb plays, that co- costly things, things that have yeah. cost you a win or cost you big in, in, in different games. Rule changes. They, they yeah. take you through rule changes, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, Brad, you the Brad Wing play was – The proper way to celebrate, the wrong way to celebrate. Right, but yeah. You, you – uh, you were gone by the time Wayne got Brad there, Wayne but, celebrated but that was the that was a, an emphasis that year. Yeah. Never got called quite like that, mm-hmm. you know. Again, brought the touchdown back. right? Brought the touchdown yeah. back, yeah. And you you saw a few of those that year, but after that, they 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 sort of you that know, was dumb. Re- re- yeah, mm-hmm. it, it was. But uh, they, at that point, they were trying to take celebration out of football. They were going to so make bad. an example yeah. out of it that year, yeah. and and they did. Then the, the the rule changes, you know, like two years ago with the you know blocking below the waist outside the tackles. I remember when they got into the the taunting. Um, that was one of the funnier lines in uh, the the thirty for thirty on the U. And see, every year they'd show us a film uh, of all of the they're things you couldn't do. And this year they're they're showing us all of the uh, the things last year that would be a foul. He goes, and it was all us. Yeah. You know, the 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 standing over them, um, the stepping over them, um, the you know talking back, the 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 whole the dancing pointing, over the top point. Pointing, and, yeah, yeah, all those things. Every example they showed was us. Uh, you know, at, at, at Miami. Okay, I kind of got off on a, a, a tan. I'm still just. I'm like. I just think really it, again. You go from the Brad Wing play to where they flag you, call back a touchdown, and then 2019 was my favorite year of LSU celebrations ever. The whole team celebrated after every time they scored, and it was kind of welcomed. Everybody loved it. Yeah, let them have a little fun. Yeah. Um, you know, with it, I'm not. I'm not for. I, I always hated the thing where you get in, you you spike the ball, and then you go, you know, celebrate with your teammates. If, there's a big difference between celebrating and taunting. Yeah. Okay. If you're celebrating with your teammates, short of you know doing that thing in the end zone the with random, the dog lifting the his balls. leg with the, the the egg bowl a couple of years ago, if you're not in somebody else's face, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some leeway here. Yeah. I'm not gonna let you act like a dog in the end zone, but I'm gonna <laughs> give you a little bit of leeway. We're here at uh, Rafino's. We're brought to you by Home Bank, Louisiana based since 1908. Business and personal banking solutions for all of your needs. Right now, some great CD rates. And, you know, the thing about uh, the CD rates right now, not only are you getting great rates, but you've got uh, a lot of different choices for uh, longer or shorter terms with some shorter term CDs that are available right now. And minimum uh, balances are very low. So you can get into this thing uh, for a reasonable amount of money. Talk about the to talk to the local bankers here at any Baton Rouge location, Corporate, Sherwood Forest, Longform Village, and Blue Bonnet. You can also find home bank locations in Acadiana, New Orleans, the North Shore, Natchez, and Houston. And you can visit home24bank.com for more information. Home Bank, member FDIC. Live and lunch from Rafino's 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. It's Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Back here at Rafino's Live at Lunch, Lock of the Week Friday. Tex Morris, Edward Jones Investments. Uh, so here's the, the official number. Uh, Max got this uh, for us. Brian Kelly, after a loss in his career, this is uh, all of his games, 41 and 22, but at LSU he's 7 and 1. The only time that they have lost back-to-back games occurred in 22 when they lost the final game to A&M and then lost in the SEC championship game to Georgia. So his record off of a loss is really good. Rich, you talked to, we were talking during the break how this only happened like once in your career yeah. is the longest 3 weeks of your life because you you lose a game, you want to come back redeem yourself, you come back, you lose again. 
And then you start questioning yourself. You're like, okay, yeah. what do we have to do to get it back? I mean, then you're, you're sitting there. The, the locker room gets real quiet. The practice fields get quiet. And, like, people are all just kind of – losing sucks. Like, I know the fans take it bad, and, like, I still take it bad. Nobody takes it worse than the guys in that locker room because the amount of blood, sweat, and tears and energy you put into it. And then you go into every game confident. I don't, like, like I've told you, you have to have that mindset. And then it's like a knock at your ego when you lose. And then you do it twice. And then you start guessing, how do we get back? And then it really puts that doubt in there. So winning – after. Getting that win right after the loss is big. Brian Kelly said in the first bye week that they were they were going they were practicing you know just it, it was going to be normal. This uh, this time it's a little bit different. If you were Brian Kelly, how would you uh, have approached this week coming off of that loss? I got guys like Dellinger. He's spending the whole week in the in the training room. He's got let me let me stop you right there. He's got a high ankle sprain. I, they they're talking optimistically. I'm sorry. I, if if he comes back from a high ankle sprain in two weeks, you know that's a. Well, I ain't seen anybody come back from a true high ankle sprain. Now maybe his. I, I, I'm no you doctor or anything like exactly that, but a, a high ankle ankle sprain in two weeks. Come on. Yeah. Um. But I also saw him warming up on the field, trying to play again, and like he was trying to get back out there. He was moving. Um. You hear high ankle sprain that's thrown out there. How bad is it really? Like, is it a true just a bad, bad high ankle sprain or? Did he tweak it and they're calling it a high ankle sprain? Um, you know, only he knows that. Only the, the locker room, the staff knows that. But uh, the guys that are any what nicked up, I mean, we spent a lot of hours in the training room. This is when you try to get back healthy. You watch a lot more film. Um, there's a lot of film time going on. You're going to practice. It, the only time we got in a little bit of uh, – the older guys got – just shoulder pads. Now, the younger guys, they wore them butts out, and they usually did young guys, what Miles called young guys go. They had scrimmages, and we used to go out there and watch it. He'd sometimes let the, the older guys coach, call the plays. Um, but uh, it's a lot of recovery and just a lot of uh, mental work. Yeah. I remember, I think, I, I remember it was Donardo or Saban, or he used to call it the puppy bowl. We're yeah. going to have a puppy bowl. It was, that was during bowl practices. We're going we're gonna to have a puppy bowl. I felt so the, bad for him because everybody that didn't really like get a lot of playing time in the game, they had to go out there full pads every day. And then we're sitting in there in our shoulder pads and our helmet. And yeah. We're excited just because as soon as they were done, you go throw a dip in, sit on the sideline, like, I'm going to watch these guys try to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wrong, man. Uh, can the running game be fixed, uh, improved, uh, whatever you want to call it? Um, I mean, we're, you, it's ninth playing date now. It's getting late early. Yes, I Oh, this is a frustrating question to me because there are times, and I've showed you, and when you go back and watch, there are holes and there, there are good designs. It just don't, doesn't seem to that we complement off of it. Uh, the, the zone read at this point in the season, it's got to go. It, it, it cuts off half the field. And I saw what they tried to do with the zone read where I talked about the counter with no pullers. I mean, that's a All zone right, you need read. To explain, you, need, you need to explain that. Okay, uh, so, you know, our big run uh, – I say our big run. Our 10-yard run in the yeah. A&M uh, with Durham, we had a, just a five linemen. We had Durham start off on the right side, motion back over to the left side. And if you watch some of the film, in the zone read, the, the running back's always going to – he can only run one direction typically in, what, in our design. If he's on the left, we're going to run zone read right. The ball's going to the right 99% of the time. Well, this past week we, we put in like a counter with no pullers, which means he started off on the left, we hammered the ball, he took two steps to the right, and then cut back to the left. And you had uh, uh, Campbell seal off to the left. Dellinger worked with the center where they doubled the, the nose tackle up to the linebacker. And we had a seam. It, it, it was open. I don't ever remember us going back to that play again. Um, but there, there were things that we tried to do to offset that were, were showing you where we're running the ball. But um, you can also go watch the film now to where every time we run a zone read, no one gives a damn about Nussmeyer. No one cares. No one's looking at him. No one's even, you know, not, not even flinching. They're all just flying to the ball. And at this point, it's, it's putting the, the cutoff blockers in a bad situation. It's putting the double team blocks and the combo blocks in a bad situation. And it's putting Durham in a bad situation. He doesn't have time to let things develop because it happens so fast. Now we get into one of our favorite uh, topics on off week, self-scouting. Okay. If you can say, and let's, let's, just, let's just say that your 99% is even close to, you know, what what they're actually doing, even if you're off a little bit, yeah, okay. Might be a little okay, bit. okay, but yeah. it's close. Eighty-five. Anything you're doing, eighty-five percent or more of the time, is pretty easy for the 
you know, the uh, other guys. Think- so if you're self-scouting yourself at LSU and you're going, man, look, every time we move – and I've watched the film with you, okay? Charlie, watch. They moved it back over this side. They're running to this side. I mean, you see it before it's coming. If, if you – you know, and now I know because you told me, uh, the other guys know. The defensive coordinators are smarter than I am. Um, yeah, my, I talked to a buddy about it yesterday. If I was LSU in this bye week, I'd have spent so much time getting the pistol and just getting it even sets to where you, know, you can go different ways. Um, you know, pistol is the next best thing to eye. We're not asking anybody to go back to power eye and do all that stuff. But then at least you are in a, a, a uh, symmetrical set to where, you know, they can't tell you which way you're going. Is that simple? Yeah, to me it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of this stuff no, is mean, in the play. To, I, to, do, to run that play you're talking about, Durham had to make a hard cut. He had to have good vision and acceleration to make that play work. That's that, a big a ask. A special player has to be able to do that. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's that, a big ask against these SEC defenses. Yeah, and a guy that can't move is not that shifty and quick. I mean, that play probably is a slower develop and doesn't hit. And gets um, two yards And gets two yards 12. because he doesn't hit the hole at the right time. But uh, there, there's things they can do. We've, we've ran some pistol, and the thing to me that is uh, – I would like to see is when we get in the goal line, we've gotten some more creative run sets recently. With we we did the the T, then we motioned back to you know with the three backs. I'm not saying go three back in the middle of the field, but there's creativity there where we've gotten guys behind the quarterback. That just seems to me that it's an easier change just to do that at a pistol in the middle of the field. They threw the ball off that formation, right? Yeah, Wasn't that yeah. the fade to Taylor? Fade to Taylor, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if Taylor's in the game and Green's in the game, okay, down by the down in the the goal line area, I'm I'm all for that. That, that that's what I'm talking about first and ten from the twenty five. Uh, yeah. Some semblance of balance. You can turn Taylor into a a fullback. Like I mean, then that's what we're really doing with him. When you put him offset in the wing, a lot of times he's flying across the backside to kick off, or he's leading up in the hole when we do run it that way. And there's different things they can do. I just think that to just throw in some more pistol formations to where you're not always, you know, running 85% of the time out of the zone read when he's on the left, you're going to the right. They put uh, Chris Hilton, the guy back uh, for this game, they targeted him a couple of times. There, were a couple, there was a, a missed jump. There was a, another miscommunication. There was one that was just looked like a bad throw. Uh, when you looked at it, did you see them – rolling coverage uh, to him to make sure somebody was over the top. They weren't paying attention to him yet. I mean, he hadn't – like what we talked about, he's got to go out there and make a few plays. For this explains time. why they kept tar- – because you get that this way. Man, look, he just got back. Why are you targeting him? Well, because they if he ever does make a play, then – And, uh, you know, look, he, w- he was rusty. He had two big plays he could have had that he just missed time jumps, jumped really early, um, put Nussmeyer in a bad situation. One, he had his guy one, Nussmeyer underthrew it, and he still missed the jump. But uh, there, you saw, when I watched him run, you saw what we were missing. Nobody runs like him out there. Nussmeyer got to bounce back off of three interceptions. He has never lacked for confidence. No. But you can get shook up a little bit uh, after, a, after a half like that. How do you think he responds? I think he does fine. I mean, like, like we talked about, he, he was pressing so hard when they can't get anything in the run game. After that first half, I mean, I don't know how many successful runs we had in the second half, not very many at all, because like I said, we had 23 rushing yards in the second drive of the game. We finished with 24. Um, I felt like he got to the point to where he tried to make a play on every throw, and he started pressing. And when you start pressing like that, you're, um, you don't make the smartest decisions. You just start panicking. And that's something that I think he can bounce back from. Look, he's always – He's, a, he's up to throw one or two a game, and we've seen that his whole career at this point. He's going to take shots, but he can't take dumb shots like the ones he had in the other game. Kelly said that, too. Uh, you yeah. know, we've got to get to the point where Garrett's not feeling like he's got to make a play every flip in time, I think was uh, – Well, see, the, the, I, no I, I think that was almost his exact quote. The, we talked the same way about Jaden Daniels at one point, but Jaden had a different arsenal where, okay, I don't have to just throw it. I can take off with my legs. It made it a lot easier for him when he – we said with the defense being bad last year, and uh, he felt like the pressure on Jaden. I remember talking about it every game. He feels like he has to score on every drive or they'll lose the game because they don't expect the defense to get any stops. But he had different weapons where he didn't have to just do it with his arm. Garrett feels like he has to make every single play with his arm. And it, yeah, it's different, right? Daniels felt like he had to make a play every time because the defense was going to give it up. Here, you've got a reasonable defense now. But you don't have a running game. Yeah. So so now you've got to make a play every time with your arm for a different reason. Yeah. Yeah.
We're brought to you by Total Maintenance, AC and heating generators, electricity, plumbing. Total Maintenance, your one-stop shop for all of these needs. One of South Louisiana's oldest and largest AC and heating companies since 1980. Their slogan has been, service today, every day, so you don't have to go to sleep hot. Or, coming up in the winter months, you don't have to go to sleep cold. Over the years, Total Maintenance has expanded their operation. Now a full staff in New Orleans. Authorized dealer for Carrier, American Standard, Daycan, and Ream AC units, and Generac and Cummings generators. For all your electrical and plumbing needs in Baton Rouge, it's 480-1000 in New Orleans, 841-3300. Service today, every day, total maintenance. We'll take a break. Lock of the Week Friday presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments from Rafinos on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. It's Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. With no LSU game, we got a, a few minutes here to talk about the, what's going on in the rest of the Southeastern Conference. I think there's some fascinating uh, storylines. First of all, Ole Miss going to Arkansas. Yeah. Arkansas bounced back in a big way. I, I know Mississippi State's not very good, but they were playing with at least a little bit of a heartbeat, and Arkansas just thrashed them for over 650 yards. Now, Ole Miss um, coming off the sandwich spot, Oklahoma last week, where they kind of milled around in the first half and got in the second half. Georgia coming to Oxford next week. And in between that, I'm just going to tell you right now, this is in my five pack. Uh, <laughs> 11 o'clock game in Fayetteville in between cool. Oklahoma, who's not very good, but it's still Oklahoma, yeah. going, and Georgia coming to Oxford next week. And you're giving me more than a touchdown. We've seen some crazy things happen between Ole Miss and Arkansas in the past. Uh, it always seems to be one of those games that's it's always tight, it's interesting. and uh, I, I just feel like when I think of that series, I think of crazy things happening in the game. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's going to be a good one to start the day with. Well, you know, they – have put so much into this season, and they've already lost at least one game more than they were supposed to. Ole Miss is capable of – if they're capable of throwing in a clunker at home against Kentucky, who's not good at all, they're certainly capable of being in a look-ahead spot. Ole Miss could lose this game and beat Georgia next week. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you. Uh, so that's, that's going to be fun to open the day. And then the cocktail party, Florida has been – competitive they have been playing hard. they hadn't been dead team walking i would say since they lost to a&m the last month has been mostly good they've won three games and they gave tennessee all they wanted in knoxville um georgia best team in the sec i guess but they seem to play down like they play really big in big games they and played play down. down to they played down to auburn they played down to mississippi state they won yeah and they they, they were never going to lose either one of those games but they didn't exactly blow the door to kentucky yeah. on the road uh florida punches chance tomorrow i hope so just make it interesting you know what we talked about earlier the more teams with more losses, it just makes us feel even better. Yeah, and then we already talked about Texas A&M uh, and South Carolina. That's the Enjoy one, the man. off weekend. Uh, we will uh, we'll be back next week uh, looking I'm for try to uh, sneak uh, over Al- to the Borough Vice see y'all Saturday. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna uh, we're gonna hunker down there. Football Sunday uh, on Sunday at 10 a.m. We'll take a break. Come back with our number two here live at lunch from the from Rafino's Lock of the Week Friday presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. The restaurant is now open here at Rafino's. Come on by and uh, check us out here for lunch where the appetizer features include the seared scallops, uh, eggplant mary, big uh, eggplant medallions. It's just delicious. One of my favorite appetizers here, the eggplant mary, jumbo lump crab meat uh, on the top. Grilled sea bass on your entree features, uh, the new, uh, dry-aged New York Strip Diane, and the dessert is the Spooky Dirt Custard, that's mocha custard with Oreo crumbles and pistachio, your dessert feature here at Rafino's. We're going to be getting into a lot of picks and a lot of games. Here's This is a pretty big story from one of the uh, weekend's bigger games. SMU quarterback Kevin Jennings has been cleared and will start against Pittsburgh tomorrow. Uh, that is uh, the the seven o'clock game. What about Eli? Uh, well, 
that he gonna play. Yeah, I would I, you know Eli. He's gonna play. He, but he, was, he, he was cleared uh, Wednesday. Uh, so, he was. Yeah, he was cleared. Uh, Narduzzi what, what's he said. got? Uh, it was. Gosh, I forgot. Um, but Narduzzi, um, Narduzzi cleared him on his radio show. He he said uh, that he's good to go. So. Um, one of the bigger games uh, this weekend, sneaky big game. SMU and Pitt is not what we thought uh, the last week or the first weekend in November would be a big game, but it is a, it is a big game. Good morning, Jimmy. How are you? I'm doing great, Charlie. It's uh, Friday Breeders' Cup weekend, college football. I mean, you know, it's it's a great weekend. It is. You got it's a great weekend. Um, you know, um, my boy uh, Big Earl, he's uh, in Del Mar. So, um, uh, best wishes to uh, <clears throat> a local owner, Greg Tramatine. He's got a horse running this weekend, quick kick. So uh, that's uh, he's out there with the crew. Uh, Greg's a, a nice guy. I know a lot of common friends and stuff and always loves talking about the horses. And um, and we'll have um, Jeff, uh, I mean, Chris Macero, who's live. And um, he was at the, the, the sales earlier this week. Just kind of setting the scene for us yeah. out at Del Mar for Breeders' Cup. Races uh, start at 1.30 our time today? Um. That's that's the card. Yeah, um, just, I don't know about the Breeders' Cup. That, right, just the, yeah, the yeah. races themselves. They, 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 they raced yesterday, too, but that was just local racing. But um, I think that's right. I think yeah. that's right. Um, and, um, Charlie, um, I hate to steal your lead here, but I, I – Go this, right ahead, Jimmy. This, you know. this is this – is, we, we the bad beats kind of, you know, they – yeah, I mean – a little overdone sometimes, huh? I, you know, you know. It's, it's still one of my favorite segments to watch. Uh, they lose me a little bit when it's it's too first, obscure. Yeah, that, that's I mean, it. I, on, it. Give us the ones that we had money on. You know. Yeah, I, I they, they, I, I love Van Pelt, and I, I think he's great. Yeah. But they've gone out of their way to yeah. find the North Dakota S- second states. half scoring in the Lehigh game. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's you know uh, second on. half total. Oh man, this is a tough right. one. Oh, who, who's betting that? You know, what I mean, so here's one for you. Our buddy uh, Jeff G. He is an Auburn guy, and he first um, he picked picked him up. He was one of our uh, our podcast Sports Better's Paradise listeners, and so I met him down at the uh, Boy Ravage. He drives down from Atlanta, and big Auburn guy, and you know loves loves his Tigers and so. On. And then he's got introduced. And now he listens to our daily show and loves it. Very complimentary. Just you know, it's like, but where would be this week? You know, just the Auburn and the Florida and the you know the Ole yeah. Miss. It's just, I mean, we sat there and watched it's an SEC the Ole Miss. Gumbo. It's 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 great, <laughs> man. It's great. And so he sent me one. He had um, a couple of um, a couple of prop bets plus uh, uh. ten thousand mm. plus ten thousand. Corley first touchdown. <laughs> Is that a tough one? Yeah. Brutal. <laughs> Corley, anytime TD, plus 3,600. Oh. I'm out of breath. <laughs> I'm out of breath. I mean, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't even have the heart to ask him how he came up with that because Corley has – Prior to last night, has touched about one time all year, which is why you're getting those kind of odds. If you watch as much college football as he was, a, he was a stud at Western Kentucky. Yeah. I mean, a stud. I mean, he was, he was the guy that I mean for multiple years. I remember there. when we do our draft prep, uh, a name that came up a lot. Um, just a dumb play. I mean, it's just, it's just dumb. Hershey was on it. You know, the only thing is, here did he cross the goal? I'm like, did no, huh? No. Really? I when mean, you you watching it live? Yes. Did you think he dropped the ball? I, I couldn't tell in real time, but as soon as they showed the highlight, but you knew it was going to be a, a reviewed play, right? I kind of didn't. I, I mean, thought it was going to be a reviewed play. I'm it, like, oh man, he dropped it. It early. happened so quick, Charlie, and the the the, the shot. It was kind of the ball was hidden. Yeah, kinda, I couldn't. You know I couldn't I mean? tell if it was no, in or no, out. No, I know it. No, that, I didn't. But, no, I did. I didn't. No, as, as soon as that ball came out, I went, oh man, did he drop it? No, early? I didn't. Yeah, I did. I, I did. I was because like, I just can't believe that we're still they're still doing this. I just can't believe that you're not – I mean, can it be – I mean, like, <laughs> to put the league in there and say, man, you're uh, you suspended three games, six games, pick your one. I mean, but the, I mean, we know New England, you know, they, they'll they cut you. But, I mean, no, no like, auto, I mean, I guess the team's going to be the only one. But, no, it's, it's, our, it's our league policy. You know, you're sitting for a month. 
Are you doing something that stupid? That's I selfish. I could see a team policy where you're doing it. Why yeah. would the, the, the league doesn't care? The, you know, then you're, okay, but, but you could do it with it. You could do it with the team within the team. Sure. Um, we, we I was talking about it with Richard. You know, you, you get uh, th- that list of things that that video that they show him. These are all the sel- he was telling. They, they did this at LSU. These are all of the selfish things you can do. It, back when he was there, uh, a big. Uh, emphasis was on no celebration. Okay, you do this celebration. This is how it can cost you. And they show them the film, and they they do that. This has got to be a part of your film. This is one of those things that you can put together a collage of about what I can think of four or five r- right off the top of my head where this is happening. Sean Watson Monday yeah, night, Deshaun the Eagles Watson. against the Cowboys. This, I mean, Tyron. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do some college examples, Pitt, Pitt. Tyron Matthew, uh, the Washington Oregon game last year, where the guy that was on like the two was, yard was line. regular season or the, the regular pack, season game. Pack, yeah, okay. he, he drops the ball on like the two yard line. You know, oh, but the other the other Washington game. No, there was another Washington game where they did it. Yeah, uh, maybe yeah, the linebacker. Maybe it yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. No, that, that was the Oregon, Oregon game. Okay, well, the no. Washington play. You could put together. Yeah, they I, were favored by like 17 and one by like 12. I told a story when Jerry Rice did this in the Superdome back mm-hmm. in the 80s. Mm-hmm. You can put together. I heard you earlier. Col- I knew exactly what you were talking you about. You can put the collage together and say, this is really stupid. This Le- is the Leon easiest Lett thing. the Super Bowl. Leon I mean, Lett we, the we Super go, Bowl. It's, it's just, it's, it's happened so much. And, and where... You're not even seeing what I want to see. What I want to coach, man. You get inside the five. You better cradle that ball. Yeah. You got. You, you don't know where it's coming. That's all they can do at that point is punch it out. I mean, we saw that last year in the, in the AFC Championship. And, game. and that's a coaching I mean, point it's, for oh, sure. Is, is ball protection inside the five yard line? They, they got to cradle it now. Uh, yeah. I mean, you see a tight end when he sees guys sure. coming behind him. They, they cradle they, the they ball cr- in the middle. Of the, the you know. Uh, but I can't get on. You know the the coaching staff for for this one. This is something that you got to know as a player. You know, you you can you can coach. Charlie, he's not being stressed enough. He's not being coached enough. It's not consequence enough. You heard him. Consequences, yeah. yes, but well, if it's, well, that's coaching. Okay, well, if if, if you want to say that there's not, when he was coaching before, no, no, I'm going to make it clear. You're not going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to make you it clear. You see New England? Yeah. I mean, so did Belichick. You, you, t- t- tell me of all the ones. Ball, ball well, they protection, did I'm, I'm fine with that. But I'm not, I'm not going to tell him every day that if you, when you're running across the goal line and there's nobody around you, don't drop the ball. I mean, at some point you've got to know that. I mean, that, that's player responsibility. <laughs> that you, how many times do I have to Charlie tell you? Charlie has to be coached. I mean, these guys are making a a gazillion dollars. You have to coach it at this point. We see it happen weekly. I'm with, I'm coaching ball. Pitt's security. got away with it uh, yes. because the damn NFL is too cheap to put a pile on cam. He got away with it. Matthew got away with it. Washington got away with it. The Jets got away with it. I'm going to coach it, but I, I'm not going to. Jets didn't get away with it. Cost him a touchdown. Well, Tell Jeff won, G. He got away. Tell they, Jeff G. He well, got away he, with it. He didn't get away with it. The Jets, <laughs> I mean, the Jets won the game. He didn't get away with it. The Jets won the game is what I mean. That hurt. That hurt this guy. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm, I was confident it was going to cost him the game at the time, just because that's they how had a whopping zero points at the time. Yeah, it was a nothing nothing game. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised it didn't come back to bite him because those kind of things usually do. Uh, there, and, and then I'll, I'll coach ball security just to, to kind of wrap up. I'll coach ball security, but there's some things that you have to uh, are just so obvious. You know, Wooden used to teach his guys on the first day of practice how to roll up their socks so they didn't get blisters. But he didn't coach rolling up their socks every day. Okay, I, if you're too, if you're not bright enough as a player when you're running across the goal line all by yourself to not drop the ball in the one-yard line. I'm not sure I can help you. It's happening way more frequently. It's not being coached enough. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, rookie minicamp, whatever. I mean, you got to – Yeah, I'm going mean, to coach it you know, part, of, part of coaching is conveying your message for, you know, you can preach it, but if they're not, they're not listening to it, responding, you're not getting through to them, well, that's part on you too. I'm going to make it real clear. Real clear. I mean, if you got to put a team policy, you're not playing. You're not active for a month. Sorry. I, I'm with you. How's that going to hurt your stats? I'm that's with you on make, the discipline, and, and that will I mean, cost you I mean, money in a lot uh, of cases. Okay, well, well, I mean, and, and if you do something that's stupid and still do it, Knowing the team policy, Charlie, there's ways to coach this. I'm sorry, and and yes, there's some, but it's happening. All I'm saying is I'm not going to go to practice every day and go, guys, don't forget when you're running across the goal line, don't drop the ball. You know that's got to be common knowledge at some point. It's common that it's not. You see it every week, and and I'll put the guy on the bench if if that happens. You see it. I mean, there's way. 
Do you, tell me during the Belichick era at New England how many times you saw it. None. He got his point across. None. Okay, it's coached. You know, it's just being coached. You know, well, so I mean, uh, I'm more inclined to blame the player there than the coach. The the, the player, man. But did you hear the? It's unacceptable. That's a cheap ass word. No, no, unacceptable is no. He ain't. You're, no, you're he's going. Gonna, he's going to. He's going to realize sitting on the bench for a month. Yeah. He re, He's going to realize it's unacceptable because our team policy is you do this and you sit for a month. Th- these are the most basic things. Is what drives you crazy. This is professional football. Pitts, Corley, and the guy from Chicago who was waving to the crowd while Washington. Started <laughs> I mean, yes. the, these I mean, are yes. things that you would get on eight-year-olds for. It's like. Son, you have to pay attention while the ball's being snapped. Son, you have to carry the ball all the way across the goal line. These are the how about, absolute how, but, youth football but, things. But I'm um, also, wait a minute, we got six seconds left in this game, or whatever it is, five seconds, three seconds left in this game, and I got three timeouts, and one of my players is acting an ass? I can yeah. call timeout. You can. I, I'm convinced he didn't see him. Maybe he, maybe how, somebody should have seen him. How did he him. not? Uh, what is he looking at if he's not looking at his players on the field? Charlie was going on the whole time. I mean, this was he was. This is not like a, like a split second. That kid was over there by the hash. He might have been looking in the center of the field at where his other DBs were uh, were positioned. I can't imagine he wouldn't have called timeout if he saw him. Should he have seen him? Yeah, you're the head coach. You're responsible <laughs> I mean, what, for everything. What, what are you looking at? Your, your phone. Response? Looking at, he could have been looking at the other ten guys. Maybe he was looking at no, his spy. No, that's that's inexcusable to me. No, that's that's not. Oh, Eberflus is going to take uh, the, the the fall for that at the end of the season. I mean, and he doubled down and said no, that had nothing to do with it. When 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 Daniels, you know, his his ball, everything he could reaches the two two or three yard line. Take your pick. I mean, yeah, that thirteen yards did make a little bit of a difference. That made a difference. Out waving to the crowd. <laughs> and then, of oh, course, that made a and difference. so they also talking about the broadcast. And here's my other one: the soapbox too. The left guard for Houston's really struggling. I mean, they, the fans are on him. He's really struggling. And they show him. He pancakes a guy on a run block, but I mean, he is just getting beat. Quentin Williams is killing him. Mm. And maybe that was one that was Buckner was going. Wait, wait, like whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh, he's a former first round pick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why did they keep rolling him out there? Yeah, uh, you, right. And, <laughs> I mean, and Quentin Williams beats a lot of people. He's a, he's a great mm. player, but this, this guy was. I was like, well, if he's he sucks match. so bad, yeah. I mean, there's nobody else that could play guard. You know, the other one that drove me crazy, and this is on on the coaches on the field goal that Houston makes. Okay, they run over the the snapper. I mean, the guy ran. Over the snapper, yes. which is a rule. Yeah. You cannot hit that guy. Yeah. And he, he makes no attempt. Now, that to me was a player that doesn't know the rule. No, well, if you're not coaching that rule, that's not common knowledge for some of those guys. And then it, it, it worked out for the Jets because he made that field goal. They took the points off the board. He missed the other one. But that was a dumb play. That's That to me, oh, that's it's a horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. Horrible. We're live here at Rafino's. Uh, boy, we got some great uh, features uh, tonight and all throughout the weekend. Scallops, the seared scallops of blood orange blanc with the fennel and apple salad. <clears throat> Excuse me, eggplant, Mary. How's already talking about? Look at the size of this I eggplant. Tell you, some huge portions. Man. Uh, uh, the uh, Jose Canseco uh, size eggplant medallions with the uh, jumbo lump crab meat mushrooms with the hollandaise and creole maniere sauce. Grilled sea bass, sold grilled Chilean sea bass, beer and bacon braised rain- rainbow chard with the pickled red onion. Suggested wine pairing is the. Peju Chardonnay out of Napa. The dry-aged New York Strip Diane, 12-ounce dry-aged New York Strip, creamy mushroom with Dijon demi gloss with the sautéed spinach. Suggested wine pairing, Frank Family Cabernet out of Napa. Dessert features today, spooky dirt custard. Man, poor kids. Uh, yeah, it rained got, pretty good last got, night. got washed out last yeah. night. Oh, I've got so much candy. Mocha custard with the Oreo crumbles and Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Chris, let's go out live to Del Mar, California. PB Chris with us right now, setting the scene for us. Who's at the, uh, the, the, the sales earlier? Chris, how's it like, man? 
pretty good. Pretty good life out here. Uh, beautiful, sunny days. A little chilly if you're inside the track because you're not getting the sun. But uh, when you're in the sun, it's a you know perfect 70, 72, 73, a little uh, warm breeze. Can't beat it. Can't beat it. How are you guys I, yeah. doing? Every every time up, you know, when Max were doing a podcast out there, he says, "Do not tell me it's chilly out there when it's about one hundred and uh, one hundred uh, the temperature and uh, um, um, uh, humidity down oh, here." It was cloudy today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I had to buy the marine to, layer. It's called a, a marine layer. You know, I had, that, to buy a breed, I had to buy a Breeders' Cup vest yesterday because it, it was a chill in the air when you were on the other side of the of the seats. But hey, you know, so, so, I'm, not, so you, I'm not complaining. You were at some Del Mar sales um, because I know when I go up to Saratoga right before their contest in August, they have their uh, Tipton flags of the Tipton sales. I mean, t- t- is, 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 what, what's the festivities going on? Uh, tell me. Uh, tell so me. Wednesday, Wednesday night was uh, interesting. It was the first time Del Mar put one of these on. They had a championship sale where they uh, offered up percentages of twelve horses that have already won something pretty big. They um, actually gave away. They sold five percent. Excuse me, five percent of Cogburn. At a crazy evaluation, um, like almost forty million dollars, um, they had a two point five percent of flight line offered for sale, and it sold for two point five million. So that's a hundred million valuation for flight line. Um, I had a friend of mine who had a percentage of the horse kill win. Um, they put up twenty five percent, but it didn't reach the, meet the reserve. Uh, it was got it got to. Five hundred seventy-five thousand, which was a two point three million valuation, but they didn't sell it because it was like a two point five was the reserve. So, some crazy money. Um, I got to you know got invited because I knew a few people involved in the sale. We actually ran into uh, one of your LSU boys, uh, Alex Breckman, who okay. um, I actually had the pleasure of hanging out with a couple couple years ago in Vegas. He remembered, and uh, he was talking his horses. He has two in today. Uh, he has Governor Sam in the sixth race. And he has uh, totally justifiable in the eighth race. So it was cool to talk to him. He was he was just as excited talking horses as he was baseball. So uh, you know, just a cool cool experience, and we had a blast. And we actually we went to the track yesterday too. And I will say one thing about the track: Del Mar is usually a speed favoring track on the dirt and the turf. Yesterday it played very fair, which um, we all acknowledge, and it's great for a horse better because you don't want to have the greatest horses in the world. Um, running into a certain bias, either speed or closing. It played very fair yesterday, so I'm excited about that. Yeah, we talked about that with Colucci yesterday, and I mentioned that too because this, the speed bias was unbelievable. The finish line was at the Modelo uh, tent, you know, as soon as they hit, hit, hit the turn there. I mean, you know, I, mean, I spent yeah, enough time. The, if you're at the top of the stretch with the lead, you're going to win at Del Mar, but that, that wasn't how it was yesterday. No, which was, no. Which was good. No, I was going to finish your uh, sentence because, and then um, uh, one of the TVG uh, or the FanDuel Racing people, um, she said, uh, I think it was Caitlin, said, that doesn't mean it's going to play like this with the, the higher level horses that are going to be this weekend. But Chris, this, you mean, come on, we sat there the, the whole meet. I mean, no, this is different. This is different with these horses. I don't know why you wouldn't take that into consideration because, man, it was all speed, uh, speed handicapping uh, back in the summer meet. Uh, before we get to it, uh, real quickly, get a couple of picks. Anything you like that sticks out to you in the well, car today I, or tomorrow? I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the most likely winner today is in race eight. Um, that's uh, Lake Victoria. It's uh, Aiden O'Brien, two-year-old uh, filly. He said it's the best two-year-old filly he's ever trained. So I mean, you might. I mean, you're not going to get a great price, but if you play in pick fives, pick threes, uh, pick four, you might want to single that horse. That's the one horse in the eighth race. Um, okay. I'm partial to the Chancer McPatrick in the juvenile, and that's the ninth race. He's a closer. He's getting an extra half a furlong here. Uh, he's going to have to chase, chase down East Avenue, who's probably going to be the favorite. He's in the one hole, so. Chance McPatrick's got a little better uh, draw. He's gonna he's gonna be outside. He should be able to sit sit back and you know blast home. Hopefully, taking care of that speed bias. Hopefully, the speed bias isn't there. So that's Chance McPatrick, the ten horse in the ninth okay. race. And if you're gonna be singling okay. uh, and you know sequential bets, I would look to single Lake Victoria, the Lake one Victoria. eight. All right, let's get to it. Uh, Auburn. This line is moving from six and a half to seven and a half. I mean. I mean, are the, the odds makers is just stubborn with uh, Vanderbilt, or I mean, it's just, uh, but that's a significant line movement for an offensively challenged team like Auburn from six and a half to seven and a half. 
Uh, that's exactly my point. Um, they're only averaging 27.6 points a game. Auburn, and that includes a 73-point uh, game against Alabama A&M. That's one of your uh, pay-for-play games. And um, they scored 45 against a horrendous New Mexico team. So they're only averaging 27.6 per game. But if you take those two games out, they're only averaging 17 points a game, 17.8 in SEC play. So unless you're holding Bandy to 10 points, how are you going to cover this seven and a half? I, I, I'm just, I don't get it. I know this Pavia has, you know, the, the injury concerns, but everything I see from the coach says he, he's going to play. So he says he wants to play. He's going to play. We try to put restrictions on him. He doesn't listen. So he's, he's just a tough guy. He's going to play. I mean, Auburn four and five against the spread. Vandy, like you mentioned, maybe they are stubborn with these lines, but they're six and two against the spread. I, I can't see any other side but taking Vandy in the seven and a half. All right, we keep waiting for this uh, flat spot for the Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, they they were awesome against uh, in their toughest game. You know, five and one. Uh, Nebraska comes in, they blast them by fifty, and then uh, and then all the pomp and circumstance, and then and they perform. You know, sometimes that uh, all of that attention with game day coming to campus for team for teams and programs that aren't used to it, man, they it's it's a distraction. Uh, not the case uh, for Indiana. Signetti is the real deal, but at some point. Do are they going to hit a flat spot, an exhale spot, maybe here at East Lansing, uh, Indiana seven and a half? I watched both of these games very closely last week because I had I had plays on Indiana and I had plays on Michigan State. So I think these games are both very deceiving. Uh, Indiana was outgained by Washington. Um, granted, they did have the backup quarterback in, and I know uh, Rourke is back, but there was a defensive um, scoop in, uh, pick six. Excuse me, sixty-seven yard pick six. There were two interceptions by Washington. They had five penalties, three sacks, and the game was extremely even. The score is a little bit misleading, 31-17. So I think that that game was a lot closer. And then the Michigan-Michigan State game, I'm not sure what um, they were doing at the end of the half, trying to get um, extra yardage in their own territory. They get uh, Childs gets strip sack, which is the biggest problem with Childs. He's a, he's a good player. He has the ability to be great, but he doesn't protect the ball. So if he can somehow protect the ball a little bit better, I feel like Michigan State outplayed Michigan and should have won the game even though they lost. And the vice versa with the same thing with Washington pretty much was even against Indiana. Now you have Indiana going on the road. Spotty's 3-1 and one at home, only lost to Ohio State. And Indiana has Michigan and Ohio State on deck. So this is definitely the sandwich spot of the year off the big game day victory. And, you know, maybe Curtis Rourke's coming back a little too soon. I'm not so sure if he's 100% healthy. I'm going to grab the eight points with Michigan State. Seven and a half right now uh, at okay, draft seven games. And but it was, seven was, and that, was eight most of the week. Let's move on. Uh, no, speaking of Nebraska, and, yes, um, you know, Michigan State uh, outgained uh, Michigan in that game last week uh, as well. Love the fight at the end of the game. But, anyway, UCLA going to Nebraska. And Nebraska, oh, man, uh, Matt Rowe, kind of. He said it. We don't want moral victories here, but I'm very proud of the way my team competed today. Nebraska now seven at home against UCLA. Yeah, competed. They had the game. They could have won the game. They had the lead against Ohio State. The almost. It's the off the almost. And now, what are you going to do? You're going to go back, back home, and it's UCLA, a team that was you know pretty much in the doldrums all year. They were only averaging five five yards per play, but. In the last three games, they picked up to 5.4 yards of play. And last week, for two weeks ago versus Rutgers, 6.6 yards of play. Uh, Ethan Garbers has finally maybe got it clicking. He was 32 for 38, four touchdowns versus Rutgers. And this team's coming off a bye in the ultimate um, you know, depression spot for Nebraska after almost beating Ohio State. Um, you're going to be – I just feel like this is a horrible flat spot for Nebraska. I think UCLA is still trying hard. They got the offense turned around a little bit. I'm going to grab the points here. I think Nebraska is just awful as a favorite, too, as well. So any points I can get with UCLA, I think this is a good spot. I think they might even pull off the victory. All right, and finally, your last two picks, a little combo pick here. Uh, Mississippi State right in the middle of this conference schedule. Here comes uh, – here comes a little sleepy Manhattan, uh, and the total you're looking at right now. Mississippi State's 18 at home against Manhattan. Total is 60. No, no, they're, they're playing UMass. UMass, I'm sorry. Jeez. No, it's okay. That's okay. Yeah, so, you know, you got a 1-7 and seven Mississippi State team favored by 18 against UMass. But, I mean, Bulldogs have, have had a have a rough schedule. They, they, had, they had a tough loss against A&M. They had the flat spot against Arkansas. 
and they, they got smoked. It was a horrible game, five turnovers, three fumbles, two interceptions by Michael Van Buren. But this Van Buren kid has got a lot of talent. He was an Oregon commit. He, um, he played well against tough competition, Texas, Georgia, and A&M. Now he gets to feast on a 2-6 and six UMass team. And before you say, hey, two wins over one win, their wins were over Central Connecticut and Wagner. Okay, so th- those are just nothing. The two weeks ago, UMass got smoked by Missouri. And Missouri's offense has been terrible of late. I think Mississippi State's offense is a little better. Missouri got 45 points against them. So I think this is a great spot to let Van Buren cook a little bit. He's going to put up a lot of points. And on the flip side, why I'm taking the over as well is that Mississippi State's defense is 128 out of 134. They're giving up 40 points a game. Granted, against a tough SEC schedule, but I think UMass can get 20 points. They got 23 versus Toledo, 20 versus Miami of Ohio, and 20 versus Northern Illinois. So I'm going Mississippi State in the over. Yes, it's a little chalky, but I, I, I think it's just a good spot for Mississippi State's offense to, to let it rip a little bit. All right, we got we got to do this, okay? We, we do. We, look, my boy Chris. He's been on Super Bowls. He's been to you know NBA Finals, Final Fours, Del Mar, Saratoga. He's at, you know, knee deep. He's handicapping every day. Chris, when we have one of these low, it's called a rent a win. <laughs> he never yeah. he never heard the term rent a win. He's yeah. he's more in the pro the pro area than the college area. Oh no, we know what rent a wins are down here, man. Team comes in, gets their check, and takes a butt whip and it gets the hell out. So how about you? Uh, how about you, Mass? schedule though. They scheduled at yes. home against Missouri, on the road at Mississippi State, and in two weeks they're going between the hedges in Georgia. Unbelievable. You <laughs> Mass? Who, who knew? Marcus Camby's coming back to play tight end. Huh? Yeah, they're picking yes, up big indeed. checks in Starkville and Athens. I still can't figure out how they got Missouri to go up there. Yes, indeed. That's hey, unbelievable. Hey, man, look, good luck to you this weekend. I got a great Alex Bregman story for, for you another time as well. When hey, I was I'll give you one more. I'm, I'm, going with, I'm going with Forever Young in the Classic, the Japan okay. horse, the one that should have won, won the Derby. He's going he's gonna to win the Classic. All right, Forever Young. You going both days? Oh, yeah, I'll be here. I'll be here. Good okay, game, man. Have fun, man. Missing it, brother. All right, thanks. Uh, all right, have fun. Right, Jimmy, have a, great, have a great weekend. Yes, indeed. Chris Macero, live from PB and Del Mar, huh, Charlie? Not a bad gig, huh? No, it's a wonderful place. How long have I had time. at least four TVs at the house in the little media center in over 30 years? Something like that. His yeah. embarrasses me. You've been, I, I'll show His you embarrasses pictures. me. I'll, I'll show you some pictures of some uh, guys you've inspired with your, your home media setup. <laughs> Don't forget our friends over at Legacy Title. Chad Reynolds, Legacy Title for all of you real estate closings. 296-0060. Full service title company servicing all of South Louisiana. Fast, friendly, professional services we get when we call 296-0060. Our great team at Legacy Title. Ashley Donald, Mariana Haynes, Adrian Galata, Michael Platt. Bu- buying, building, refinancing. Nobody choose but you. Choose Chad Reynolds and Legacy Title. 296 296- Double O six O, the eighty percent club and more. We come back with Troy Macker and live at lunch here from Rafino's Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments on one hundred four five ESPN Baton Rouge. Jimmy, Charlie, and Troy. Three best buddies sitting around talking sports bets. Let's welcome in Troy Macker from Bat Rivers. All right, Troy, let's get right to it. College football, big slate this weekend, 80% club. What are we looking at this week? Yeah, so, you know, we got uh, about 11 teams backed by at least 80% of the money and uh, 12 teams backed by at least 80% of the tickets. So I'll look at the the, uh, the seven teams backed by both 80% okay. of the money and, and the tickets. So that okay. gives you a kind of consensus there. Um, there's a unique one that's flip side on both of that, and that's Auburn. Uh, minus seven and a half is currently backed by 87 percent of the money, but Vandy plus seven and a half is backed by 84 percent of the tickets. We've taken several wow. good bets on Auburn, even though a lot of the tickets, the public backing Vandy, you'd expect it. People have been high on Vandy this year, but if we're talking teams backed by 80 percent on both, um, we'll start you know at the top by money. It's Mississippi State against UMass. UMass is dreadful. Mississippi State minus 17 and a half, 99 percent of the money, 81 percent of the tickets. Central Florida minus six against Arizona. People have been on Central Florida the last couple of weeks. Ninety-three I mean, percent of the money, eighty-three percent of the tickets. Charlie, Central Florida stove, huh? huh? I mean, I've, I've been on. I'm off of it. What What are you backing? They haven't won a game since the <laughs> beginning of been middle of September. And, and, and the TCU win was By a point. Uh, no, but they got a huge call. They kept the drive going. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a bad call. I'm sorry, Troy. The Central Florida continue. I'm sorry. 
Well, I think what they're not backing Central Florida as much as they're fading Arizona. I believe Arizona is one of the worst teams against the spread this year. They've covered maybe one, they're like one seven and one or something. So I think okay. this is as much of a fade as it is a back. Um, Max, check on that. Go up, ahead. Next up, South Alabama minus six uh, against Georgia Southern. Ninety three percent of the money, ninety seven percent of the tickets, and then Indiana, the darling of, of the country, uh, the last three weeks, one of our most wagered on teams and one of the most the strongest public plays of the last three weeks. Indiana minus seven, ninety percent of the money, eighty nine percent of the tickets at Michigan State. Uh, Indiana to cover is the fifth most wagered on play and the most popular play of the weekend thus far. So everyone will be on Indiana. Um, they've been, you know, one of the best stores of college football, and they're just really fun to watch. We've talked about it in the past. They're oh. explosive, whether or not they have their starter in or not. I, I will. I'll make a little play here, Charlie. They're not going to. Go throw the ball down before crossing the goal line. Not this team. No good. Guess. They're 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 coached a little bit. They're a little bit. They're unbelievable. They're beautiful to watch. I mean, they're it's basically a coaching clinic on how to wrap when you hit, how to rally to the ball, how to you know sustain a block and you're going to block and 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 just 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 everything they do. They get the most out of it. It's the little things. I said, ask Garrett Cole about the little things. Troy, I digress. We continue to uh, Max. You was, Indiana seven one against the spread. Arizona one and. Seven against the spread. No, Indiana's eight no against spread. They're eight eight no straight up, eight and no against spread. Even at Red win with against that directional team. No, they're undefeated. FIU, they were twenty six point favorite. They won by twenty four. So maybe depending. That was when you got a, it. it might have been a, a, a line a line adjustment there. Okay, okay. Uh, because we we have been talking about them. They've been undefeated for quite some time. Way way past that FIU. All right, after Indiana, who's the other three? Uh, we have Oregon minus 14 at Michigan, 87% of the money, 85% of the tickets. Uh, Kansas State minus 12 at Houston. I've been tailing, I've been fading Houston all year, and it hasn't done me a lot of favors, especially not last week. I believe you were on Houston to cover, which was a smart play uh, going against the public. But Kansas State minus 12 and a half, 87% of the money, 80% of the tickets. And then Colorado State minus two at Nevada, 81% of the money and 83% of the tickets. I think that is more a fade on Nevada than a, a play on Kansas State. Yeah, that's um, that's a, that, that's um, the old coach, old Nevada coach, uh, Novell, uh, going against them uh, right there as well. All right, what are we looking at uh, about uh, three to five of the, the most public plays with the spread in the NFL this weekend? Yeah, well, you know, only one team uh, is above eighty uh, percent of the, uh, the the tickets on the spread line, and that's Washington. The Commanders at the Giants. Uh, right now, it's minus four. I think it opened three and a half. Um, 80, 81% of the tickets is on the Commanders to cover at the Giants. Uh, then we have the Philadelphia Eagles, minus 7.5 at home against Jacksonville, 79% of the tickets. Uh, the Lions, minus 2.5 at Green Bay, 76% of the tickets. Uh, that game early, the look-ahead line was Green Bay, minus 1, but it has shifted. Uh, then, uh, you know, after Sunday's games, it was Detroit, minus 4, and that has come down to Detroit, minus 2.5. I do think, you know, the health of Jordan Love will, will play into that as we see uh, tickets and money come in over the next 24 hours. New Orleans minus seven at Carolina is 69% of the money. And New England plus three and a half, 69% of the money at Tennessee. Um, you know, and, but those, those last two dropping down into the 60%. So, um, yeah. not a ton of conviction, but, you know, we're getting into a lot of, uh, uh, divisional play, you know, especially with that Washington New York game. It's really tough to pick. Um, and, you know, same with New Orleans, Carolina, even though Carolina's going back to Bryce Young, I would have expected that spread number to be a bit stronger um, just because people are very out on Bryce Young. But um, And New England, people seem to be either fading Tennessee or, you know, riding uh, healthy Drake May look good. New England is the only dog um, backed by at least 68% of the tickets. Right. Troy, I introduce you to the only team that can halt the auto fade on Carolina, the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> No, they're they're betting them though. They're, and, and to uh, Troy's point, I, I they, they bet more against the, the, the bad teams than they are betting, yeah. you know, the good so, teams. So the Saints have got them in the sixty percent range. Troy, what is the average fade on um, Carolina? Probably in the nineties, right? Eighties or nineties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say, yeah it that cools a little bit. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, bit. yes. The the fade percentage has <laughs> yeah. cooled down. Yes, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, we're talking money line is it's basically ninety percent of the money line money is on the Saints and, and the Carolina Panthers uh, have been you know I think it's like fifteen percent or less of the money in six or seven games thus far. If you look at the ninety percent teams that have been back by ninety percent of of money line money, um, the Panthers are littered uh, in the list. <laughs> 
You know, um, Houston and Willie Fritz took over a really rough situation coming over from Tulane, and we we think the world of him. We think he's, you know, not just personally. We don't even know him personally, but just uh, how good of a coach he is. And, man, he changed quarterbacks. He's figuring out his – they're becoming more competitive, you know. Now, they got they got ambushed uh, in Lawrence, Kansas. Kansas got, got them pretty good. Uh, jumped on them 21-0 right out the chute. But they, um, they, they won last week, and they're kind of – you know, it just it, he, he's he beat him now because he is going to get a better roster. He is uh, going to get. Well, how old is he now, Charlie? Six. Prince is like yeah, early six, uh, like sixty, sixty-one, something. Yeah, like that. yeah. So, Troy, anything you like before we let you go? Yeah, well, I mentioned uh, them thus far, uh, so I'm playing with the public. But I really like Indiana uh, minus seven and a half at Michigan State. I really like Oregon minus fourteen at Michigan. I've been fading Michigan all year. They. They bit me in the butt uh, twice, but uh, more often than not, I've been really good there. So, um, you know, those are the two I'm, I'm looking at. And then next week, uh, next Saturday, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but there's a massive uh, UFC fight with John Jones making his uh, return, and there's a ton of bets to make there in the finish and uh, the round department. So I'm very, uh, very excited for that. And also college basketball begins next week. So this is the last weekend before I really get into the, the thick of things that uh, mean a lot to me. Plus, you know, my football team, the Commanders, is doing pretty well. So hopefully we'll have another good weekend and uh, looking forward to uh, getting out of it in the, uh, the deep fall. Yeah, Kenny White telling us yesterday his McNeese State in his top 40. They're going to Tuscaloosa two days after LSU plays Alabama in football uh, over here uh, in Tiger Stadium. Follow Troy on Twitter all uh, all year long. Very good uh, stuff that he puts out there where the public action is and things like this. At Troy Macker, M-A-C-H-I-R. Troy, have a great weekend, man. We appreciate it. Good stuff. You do the same. Thanks, guys. Don't f- try. Willie Fritz, 64 years She's old, far. a year older than Kirk Signetti in Indiana. So much for them guys you can't hire in the 60s, huh? They look like two pretty good hires to me. Because you you, you yeah. brought this up like like Pold and, yeah. and Willie Fritz. Oh, and and a, I mean, I, I think it's kind of the Saban deal. I mean, Sab- Saban's got, he's for his age, he's got way more in the tank. He's almost like he's 10 years younger. And I understand yeah. you want a young guy because it requires energy. Because you got But if you got a guy that's... You know, that age, and he's, he's got the – I mean, if you go on – Leipold is doing it at Buffalo and Kansas. He doesn't have energy, and I know it's a rough year for him. He's got some energy. He's got a lot of it. I think that that old old habits die hard. You wanted to hire a coach. Man, we want this guy here for 20 years. Nobody stays 20 years no, anymore. No. You, if you get him for six or seven, you're doing good. Charlie, sounds like you just Googled Kirk Sinetti. There you go. Google me, baby. To- <laughs> Total maintenance, uh, one of Louisiana's uh, oldest and largest AC heating and uh, uh, AC and heating companies. Since 1980, my boy Lucas Ragusa doing a great job over there. AC heating, gener- generator installations, maintenance, service to Day, every day means same day service means you'll never sleep hot call today and get service today so factory authorized dealers for carrier american standard dakin and ream products and our membership programs cover all services with discounts and extended warranties we'll let you know when it's time for your unit to be serviced and we know that's not exactly a priority uh, on your busy, busy schedule. Mention my name, Jimmy Ott, and get half-off diagnostics, including after hours, holidays, or weekends, or also one-time heat or AC visit. Mention my name, Jimmy Ott, $79 instead of $179. Total maintenance. Total maintenance. We are total maintenance. 480 1000 Signetti, four months older than Brian Kelly. Just if you keep in track over there. Live at lunch from Rafino's Log of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. It's Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. You're listening to Sports Better's Paradise on the Bet Rivers Network. You know, first of all, Clemson, obviously, they began the year with a big thud. Uh, lost to Cle- uh, lost to Georgia rather 34 to three there in the neutral site game uh, in Atlanta. But since then, Clemson six straight uh, victories. They've won those games by an average of 27.3 points per game. All their victories by double digits. In fact, their closest game since losing to Georgia, a 16 point victory at Florida State the first Saturday in October. Clemson, the offense has been very good behind Klubnik. They've scored 40 or more points in five of their last six games. 
ranking the top five nationally in both scoring offense and total offense. They average 42 points a game, a little over 490 yards per game. So they are very prolific offensively after kind of taking, not kind of, they have taken a downturn in offense uh, the past couple of seasons, but they seem to have uh, regained their, uh, their offensive magic, so to speak. And much is due to the uh, play of former five-star recruit uh, Cade Klubnik, as we mentioned. Uh, he was a guy who in his debut season last year as a starter, kind of up and down, uh, probably at least mildly disappointing for most uh, Clemson fans. But he's really prospered in his second season as Clemson's starting quarterback. He's thrown for 1,836 yards, average of 8.4 yards per attempt, 20 touchdowns against just three interceptions, so a very good ratio there. You talked about Louisville, and it's been mostly – they're five and three, but it's been mostly uninspiring. You mentioned the victory over Georgia Tech, which could have gone the, uh, the other way. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think they've been – it's fair to say they've been a mild disappointment, and they've failed to cover now five straight games. So they have five straight nine covers. They're 0-3 against the spread – on the road this season, and that includes a seven-point loss at Notre Dame, a game that closed at six and a half. Another thing I really like in this game that I think comes into our handicapping uh, puzzle this time of the year, Louisville playing for the seventh straight week, Clemson off a bye. So Louisville playing for the seventh straight week as those bumps and bruises start to accumulate. They're going to be down two receivers. Their quarterback, Tyler Schuff, can be a little bit shaky in the turnover department. Clemson gets a bye, so they're a little bit refreshed. I think Clemson wins this game by 11 or more. I like Clemson over Louisville Saturday in Death Valley. It's Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Great specials all weekend long. Scallops and eggplant Mary for the appetizer uh, features this weekend. Grilled sea bass and dry aged New York strip Diane, our entree features, our dessert feature, low spooky dirt custard, mocha custard with the Oreo crumbles, pistachio biscotti. Let's go out to Las Vegas, our buddy Bruce Marshall. I presume you're in Las Vegas right now. We're all traveler. Where are you? Uh, are you in Vegas right now? Yes, I am actually in Las Vegas, believe it or not. There you go. There you go. Um, Brucey, um, let's get to the big one. Uh, in uh, Penn State and Ohio State, we just heard word that um, Allaire, uh, Aller, Drew Aller will start. Um, the backup did a really nice job. Uh, he started uh, the second half. Aller exited the field about a minute to go uh, in the second half before the team did. He's got a left knee, might be a sprained MCL. I think both are expected to play. In this game, somebody's got to do something, huh? Well, you know, everybody makes a lot out of uh, Franklin and his, um, you know, the hump games. He can't just beat the big boys, Michigan and Penn State uh, in the Big Ten. And then Ryan Day, man, they are. <laughs> You'd think, man, he's under some heat. These people in Columbus are not happy with him. But in the end, this game's probably going to mean seeding only. Your thoughts on the big one? It's down to three now at our local book here at the DraftKings Sportsbook at the Queen Casino. Uh, who you got? Yeah, uh, quick reminder, college hoop starts on Monday, by the way, so just so uh, we get that out of the way. Uh, so that's coming up, too. Um, yeah, Aller plays, although uh, the backup for Bula did not do bad last week, um, and that was, a, that was a game looked like Penn State was in some trouble. And everything you say is true. Uh, they're a little impatient at Ohio State, a little spoiled. Yep. And uh, Penn State, the James Franklin, could use a win over one of these big boys in the Big Ten. He hasn't beaten Ohio State since 2016. Here's my thought. Um, I really don't think that Chip Kelly is the big bonus running the Ohio State offense that Ryan Day thinks he is. They go back a long way, so he's very partial to Kelly back uh, roots at New Hampshire, actually. But uh, Kelly's offenses have not been, there was a time when he was a very avant-garde play caller. And back in his days at Oregon, and he was doing a lot of stuff with read options and things like that and tempo that a lot of teams have since adopted. adapted. And 
it, it, his stuff. I mean, I watched him at UCLA six years. They're okay, they're okay, and they teams generally run, but they're not that. Uh, it wasn't that special. And his best offenses have had quarterbacks who could move. Um, Will Howard isn't exactly that guy. I mean, he's good. I'm, I'm still not sure he's that much of an upgrade over McCord from last year. Well, the McCord before the Pittsburgh game for Syracuse. But I'm just not sure Ohio State's quite at that level it was in in recent years, or pre-2023. So I'm going back when they had Fields there, when they had Stroud. I just don't know they have that same cutting edge. And this actually might be a spot where Penn State can do it. Um, Al are in there. Listen, we talked about Andy Kotelnicki coming in from Kansas and reviving this offense. They are a lot more uh, aggressive and progressive than they were last year and the year before. I mean, Al has been throwing the ball downfield. The backup even came in and looked pretty good last week. By me, I think they're a wee bit too cutesy. Because I saw them in person against SC a few weeks ago, and there's a you know it's just a little bit too much finesse. But I think they they can run the ball if they want, and I don't think Ohio State is quite the same. We saw they were they were life and death with Nebraska last week. I think James Franklin gets them here, and uh, so I'm going to go 24-20 Penn State, and uh, man, they will tear up uh, Happy Valley uh, if that happens uh, tomorrow. All right, uh, another interesting uh, handicap. It's not one of the biggest games out there by, 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 by any means, but, I mean, tons of tickets coming in on Vanderbilt. Again, Vanderbilt uh, covers easily, although uh, there was a pick six that was erased off the board that would have put a Texas up with a, just a minute and a half to go, uh, put them up 17. That was called back. One of ten penalties on the day uh, for Texas, but Pavi got them down and made the final score three, and they could cover uh, easily the final score. Tons of tickets on them, but a lot of big tickets on Auburn here. We've seen this line jump from six and a half to seven and a half, Bruce. What you think? I am actually with that jump, and I'll qualify this by saying, and this is this is just from having done this for over forty years professionally, and and having seen teams do occasionally teams do what Vanderbilt does, really punch above their weight. Uh, outstanding uh, at five and zero as an underdog thus far, and I mean Pavia, we've talked about it on the show before. Uh, if you look at what has happened to this point, there is a great case to be made for Vanderbilt. But I am telling you right now, I, my gut feeling is is that this can't continue for Vanderbilt, and that these teams run out of gas at some point. And I think this is where it starts for Vanderbilt. I would not be surprised if they don't win another game uh, the rest of the way. And this is just from past experience doing this. Keep in mind, Hugh Freeze and his staff and a lot of these Auburn players have been hearing for the last year about that New Mexico State game last year. Clark Lee certainly saw that. That's why he went down to Las Cruces and pulled Tim back out of there, the offensive coordinator. Then he got Jerry Kill out of retirement because he retired after last year. And then he got Diego Pavia, the quarterback. So they're all now on Vanderbilt. This is as close as Auburn is going to get to having some revenge for that New Mexico State game last year. And don't think those guys don't know about it because they have heard about it nonstop for almost 12 months. Also, Auburn ain't playing that bad. The Georgia effort was good. Uh, they were they were fighting well into the second half, close to Georgia. Could have easily won that Missouri game two weeks ago. They led most of the way, and they came back on Kentucky last week. Jarquez Hunter ran great, almost 300 yards, my God. But look at Peyton Thorne the last three games. Uh, he's only thrown one pick. He's completing about 65% of his passes. They probably should have beat Oklahoma before that, but that was interesting. They, You know, playing from ahead sometimes, Auburn has had trouble. They played from behind last week and won. They were down 10 nothing and took over. I think they're coming on right now. I think this is a chance for Hugh Freeze and the staff to kind of erase that New Mexico State. They won't be able to totally erase it, but this is as close as they can come. And I am laying it with Auburn tomorrow. I think they're actually going to win and maybe win decisively. Pavia beat Freeze last year in Jordan Hare as the New Mexico State uh, quarterback. But two years ago, he beat Freeze again in a regular season game and drilled yes. him pretty good uh, when uh, Freeze was at Liberty. All right, um, give, give us a, a couple other others, that, the more high-profile uh, games that you look before we get into some of the smaller conferences. Yeah, um, 
I'm going to it's, it's going to the ACC for a couple of these. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure it's high profile anymore with the Florida State, but there's a difference between teams that are finding ways to get beat, like, say, in the NFL, the Jets before last night, and they finally won, just keeping on making mistakes and just being flat-out bad. I think Florida State is flat-out bad uh, this year. And uh, you, you talk to people down there, none of the the portal, and they, they've lived in the portal a lot the last few years. They had a lot of reloading to do after last season, uh, but the, the line play has not been good, and the quarterback play undeniably bad. Well, DJU in there, who's a big disappointment, and Brock Glenn and then the freshman, they are just, they are mechanical as can be. They can't really do anything. This team is bad. They are a legitimate one and seven right now. North Carolina is one of those teams. They found ways to lose several games this year, and I know they went, what, 12 games against FBS <coughs> foes before actually covering one. They finally did last week in grand fashion against Virginia. How about 10 sacks? against uh, uh, Colandria and Musket, the quarterbacks for Virginia. Chriswell played a very good game at quarterback. They are flat out better than Florida State, and it looks like they might be ready to run a little, make a nice little November run. I'm going to take North Carolina there. Um, Duke and Miami a little bit earlier tomorrow, kickoff uh, down at Hard Rock. This is the Manny Diaz Bowl. Hmm. I still maintain uh, Diaz was a little bit unfairly pushed out. After 2021, he hadn't done that badly. But I know there was stuff behind the scenes there, very political, booster-related. Cristobal was the guy for the big boosters down there. They wanted him back. Uh, there was some play. <laughs> he is his father. He used to be mayor in Miami. I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of intrigue behind the scene. Anyway, Diaz comes back, first time to face Miami since. Duke ain't that bad. They got a defense, and Manny is a defensive uh, guy that can do some things. They forced a lot of turnovers. And, uh, and he will not sit back against Cam Ward the way we saw Florida and a couple of other teams earlier in the year. I am still not completely convinced about Miami. I think they legitimately should have two losses right now if the ACC referees and replay officials played it straight, which they didn't. Um, and this team is a little bit of a fraud, I think, being undefeated. So you're getting – I see you got 21 out there this morning with Duke. I'm taking it, Jimmy, with the Blue Devils tomorrow – in the early kickoff at Hard Rock. Man, you got to win a game, though, when you're plus six in the turnover battle. <laughs> Brucey, I mean, yeah. that was, uh, Van Dyke almost uh, single-handedly uh, saved his job for him. Remember that game against Florida State where I think Florida State, Jordan Travis, that was kind of one of his breakout games, too, converted like a fourth and 12. It was a late, late touchdown drive. Miami was winning that game uh, at uh, – because they, 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 they were on a roll uh, late that year, but that game probably cost him uh, his job. Brucey, some of the smaller conferences, who we got? Let's go to the uh, Commander-in-Chief tomorrow with Air Force and Army. Now, we haven't seen a number like this in one of these games in a long time. It's over three touchdowns. We've got a total, which is coming down a bit. I mean, I still see a couple 42s out there, 41 and a half. Just because the nature of the rivalry, I'm a little reluctant to lay that many points. Army is the class team this year, and this is – we know how good they are. And and Air Force is – this is the worst Troy Calhoun team. This is worse than his 2013 team. That team was decimated by injuries. They had to play five guys at quarterback. This team is just flat-out bad. Look at those stats for Air Force. We're here in November. Their top rusher has 212 yards rushing. They are not running the ball like they used to. They are not scoring like they used to. All their points, really, this year came in that one game against New Mexico. They scored 37 – through other last six games, they've scored a combined 49 points. I think this one stays under. Army's defense is pretty uh, is pretty raucous there, and I just don't know that Air Force is going to score. Maybe they'll give them seven. Uh, but if you can get a 42, I'd go under that one. And Mikey up in the beautiful West Point tomorrow. One other one sticking in the Mountain West. Uh, Fresno is showing me something here. You know, maybe I got a little off track watching that UNLV game where just everything went wrong. I was very impressed with what they did two weeks ago in the second half against Nevada. They probably should have covered that game, but they still came back and won. Tim Skipper looks like they're playing hard for him. He may keep the job on a permanent basis. Um, that was a good win over San Jose last week. Very good. And Hawaii is no better than San Jose. Um, but Skipper's defense, I think, uh, will keep Shager and the Hawaii offense in check. Hawaii's had trouble traveling to the mainland this year. I think Fresno, you're going to lay about 13 or so tomorrow. 
13 and a half, I'd do it. I think they win like they did against uh, San Jose last week. All right, uh, Brucey, uh, good job. Uh, anything else well, before we let you go? You uh, making it down for the Dodgers uh, parade, championship parade, huh? Mm-hmm. The Grand Marshal? Uh, no, I think I'll stay in another <laughs> state when that happens. Oh, I'll, let me let me throw you one other one real quick. Uh-huh. I think Michigan State's I think Michigan State's going to give Indiana a fight tomorrow. I can't yeah. believe a team. I know Indiana's great and Rourke's going to play. I can't believe a team's going to go all year never trailing in a game. I want to see what they do if they get behind. Something tells me Michigan State's going to put up a good fight tomorrow in East Lansing. Where would you have in your power ratings, uh, Indiana? You think? Um, I mean, we're ranked in the country. Point spread, right now. point spread value, point spread value. Oh, power yeah. Not, 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 not yeah. what they've done and what they I mean. Yeah, well, it's all it's in relation to everybody else. I mean, they're good. I mean, I've got them as a favorite in this game. I mean, my my ratings have them six in this game uh, against uh, Michigan State. Now they wouldn't. I mean, in September, I would have probably had Michigan State six or seven until later in the month in September. Uh, but it's it's just the pattern of their game. They, a team cannot continue to play as well as Indiana has. I mean, it's very very difficult to never trail in a game. I want to see what they do if they get behind. So my power ratings have this number just a wee bit less than what. The spread is here, but um, I, I, this Jonathan Smith, good good underdog coach. I just think in an era of, in an, has trouble in, in an era of just such low football IQ, and we see it at all levels. Uh, last night again with the Jets, Corley. Uh, I mean, just cannot get to the end zone first. <clears throat> Pitts on Sunday. We go on and on the the, you know, the leverage play on the field goal. I mean, just just over and over some dumb stuff. I mean, Garrett Cole can't run. I mean, really, and thirty eight million is not enough for you to cover a ball hit on the right side, get to first base. You know, five runs later, how you feeling about it now? See if he does that from uh, moving forward. But this Indiana, they so smart, they're so IQ. But damn it, it's college football, and you cannot. Blow out. That's a big high. Blowing out the best team at that point that you played in Nebraska, a much more storied team uh, than you. And then you got all the pomp and circumstance of ESPN's game day coming there, yep. and you perform it again. And then you have Ohio State on the horizon. I mean, how can they not be flat? How can they not Jimmy, be that, vulnerable right here? You know, Jimmy. I remember the last time Indiana was eight and zero in this same spot in '67. They went into Minnesota. They had the big game with Purdue. That was a big game against Minnesota that year, too, and they got spanked. Then they beat Purdue in the last game when the Leroy Keys was there in Phipps and ended up getting in the Rose Bowl. But this 8-0, they've never gone beyond 8-0. It's going to be tough tomorrow. I'm telling you, Michigan State's going to play them tough. Well, the, the thing is, that quarterback is inconsistent. Okay, I mean, yeah. he was, he make, yeah. he'll make some plays, but his mistakes cost them that Boston College game. Uh, on the road. Yes. I mean, it was him. I mean, it was. Yeah. Look, this is this is the. You talk about the year. The, the, the this is the year of the inconsistent quarterback. Well, I mean, tell tell me, nobody's consistent besides Diego Pavia, and he can be a I little know. inconsistent at times. If if I didn't see Michigan State beat Iowa a couple weeks ago, I, I probably wouldn't be on here. But I know they got it in them, and uh, that was that was a, uh, that's the best defense they're going to see, and they they took care of Iowa. So I think they're going to play them good tomorrow. We'll see. I, I, it's the, the emotional advantage is uh, no, no doubt. Charlie, you had something. Well, this may be um, the the most consensus we've had of our uh, of our Michigan experts. State. Matt Humans, Kenny White, Chris Massero, now Bruce, uh, all on uh, like in Michigan um, State. Put me so, down too. Yeah, uh, it's probably the most love we've gotten on a pick this year. But eighty percent club. Troy Macker from Bet Rivers let us know that the, the tickets are all on Indiana. I mean, I mean they're cash of tickets. They're just going to say, sure. you know, I mean, they're betting blind. And I mean, and, and why not? Why not? So I had Indiana last week, but I'm on, I'm on the other side uh, this week. All right, Brucey, good job. How was you? How was Oxford? Real quick. Oh, it was fine, and you were right about the uh, clientele there. Although, uh, no women <laughs> go to Temple games, so I can't really compare it to anything. So I, but <laughs> what a Bruce. I mean, <laughs> yes, there's a little bit better scenery in Oxford on game day than Temple. Yes, that, uh, that's just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just just a tad. Just a tad. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. We'll talk to you next week. Okay. All okay. right. Don't forget our friends at United Community Bank, the local way to bank big with locations from Baton Rouge to Golden Meadow. 
including their newest branch at Burbank and Blue Bonnet. We've been serving the people of Southern Louisiana for over 50 years. At the United Community Bank, your business is our business. We support the hardworking folks behind local business. From initial startup loans to ongoing planning and assessments, United Community Bank is here for you. A great team of bankers, Heath Meir, Prentice Wilkes, Nicole Glover, Hunter Creed, David Campbell, David Henry. Stop on by and discuss how we can help your business today. United Community Bank, member of FDIC, equal housing lender. Bog of the Week Friday presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments from Rafino's on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Charles Hanegriff's Five Pack of Picks. Brought to you by Supreme Rice. Make sure you use Louisiana rice grown by Louisiana farmers since 1936. Available at most local grocery stores. Supreme Rice. All right. Uh, see if we can uh, do a little bit better. Three and two last week. Not bad. And I deserved all, all five of them. I thought uh, no, no funny business uh, last week. So see what we can do here. I'm on Penn State. Uh, plus the three. You look at any category uh, that uh, these teams have statistically, and they're even. Uh, they're either one in front or one behind uh, each other. Everything that, that matters, every stat that matters to me anyway. Penn State uh, has a quarterback situation at least uh, you know in, in as good a shape as they can be in. They'll have a lot ready to go. Uh, they'll have both quarterbacks available to them. They got the home field and they got three points. Uh, I'm going to take the Nittany Lions plus the three. And you know, Jimmy, it, it, Ohio State, if they drop this one, man, the pressure. Oh, when no, Indiana, Indiana gets game. there. Uh, yeah, and, and Michigan too, of course, but that's that game's in a whole different category. Um, they they dropped this one. They lose to Indiana. They're out of the playoff, uh, and you would have never – you couldn't find a single projection that had Ohio State out of the playoffs. So, a bunch of pressure on the Buckeyes. I like Penn State tomorrow, plus the three. Going to take Arkansas, plus the seven. Sorry to see this one uh, start to slide back in the other direction because it had climbed up a little bit uh, to seven and a half, even to eight yesterday at some point. We'll take the seven points. Nice spot for Arkansas here. They catch Ole Miss between home games and before Georgia visits next week. And you sleepy little 11 o'clock start. You know, Arkansas has only played about two and a half bad quarters of football this year. The fourth quarter against Oklahoma State plus the overtime. And then the fourth quarter and a little bit against LSU. Everybody else, they've been fine. They went up against Texas A&M. They did fine. They went up against Tennessee. They won that game. Uh, they rebounded, I thought, very nicely from the LSU loss. Uh, just paced in Mississippi State last week. Give me the seven points. Uh, I like the spot for Arkansas against Ole Miss. Going to take Florida plus 14.5 against Georgia. Florida hadn't been dead team walking in about a month. And Georgia doesn't blow everybody out. They've kind of played up and down. They, they let Auburn hang around in the game. They let Mississippi State hang around in the game. They let Kentucky hang around in the game. Uh, Florida has lost their last three in this series by an average of 24 points. I think they're going to play with a heartbeat tomorrow. I don't think they win, but if you're giving me more than two touchdowns in the rivalry game, I'm going to take the Gators plus 14 and a half. South Carolina plus three and a half. Again, I like the spot. A&M huge win last week against LSU, and now it's like a four-game pregame to the four-week pregame to the Texas game uh, for them. Problem is South Carolina ain't bad. Gamecocks have played twice as many bad quarters as Arkansas this year. They've played four. All of them against Ole Miss. They lost to LSU by three. They lost to Alabama by two. They stomped a mud hole in Kentucky, and they just clobbered Oklahoma and Norman. And that was two weeks ago. So they're off a bye, home for the first time in four weeks, opponent coming off an emotional game, quarterback situation, potentially good for A&M, but there's no guarantee Marcel Reed's going to play uh, the way he has in uh, the game against LSU. So that's a little bit unsettled. All of that, and I'm getting points with the home team. Yep. South Carolina plus three and a half. And I'm going to take Washington plus the two. USC gets the close but no cigar award this year. Actually, they have to split it with Kansas, but you get the idea. And I say that as an alumnus of the one school that USC actually came through in the clutch against. They could have won at Michigan. They could have won at Minnesota. They could have won at Maryland. They could have won at home against Penn State, but they didn't win any of those games. They won zero. True road games this year, they've won zero. But all they've done about in the last month is beat Rutgers, and that was after the Scarlet Knights had to fly 
fly through three time zones for a league game. Washington playing their first home game in a month. They're exactly one yard in the Apple Cup away from being 5-0 and at home. The Huskies' yards per play on offense is a little bit better than USC's. The Huskies' yard per play on defense is a lot better than USC's. And I'm getting points. Yep, yep. Washington plus the two. So Penn State at home plus the three. Arkansas at home plus the seven. South Carolina at home plus the three and a half. Washington at home plus the two. And Florida in Jacksonville plus 14 and a half against Georgia. All right, uh, Aller uh, is going to go. I think it's an MCL sprain the way they are uh, talking about it. Uh, you know, put the, the the brace on his left knee, um, and you can tell it's it's very sensitive on the inside when you got that. And you saw it's just, it's what Mahomes rushed back last year in the playoffs one week, but he will not be a hundred percent. So Prabula is. Uh, I, I will be shocked if he doesn't get some snaps, and he performed. As well as you could possibly do it. I mean, what, um, 80% of his passes are touchdown uh, for 80 yards. What, about uh, eight and a half yards an attempt, nine yards, touchdown, uh, rest for about 40 more yards with, with his legs. So um, I think you're going to get both of them. Charlie, the, uh, two of your picks are on the um, the beneficial side of the, for the, the one of the big games. Look ahead spot. Georgia uh, goes to Oxford next weekend. You've got the two teams against those two teams. Uh, Lane Kiffin's already complaining, especially for the runts here. You know, going to play Arkansas, although they have uh, – Halloween season, Fedsville's been a ha- haunted house uh, for the Ole Miss Rebels. I yeah. mean, they really uh, have their struggles there. South Carolina jumped from two-and-a-half to three-and-a-half. Emotional? A little emotion for the Aggies? Certainly in the second half it was. Is that one of the biggest wins they've had in a long time? Absolutely, double digit do- uh, a double digit deficit. They've never had to lead in the SEC this late in the season, so to put to put them there, yes, absolutely. double digit uh, deficit. Second half turns into a double digit win. Yeah. yeah, I'd say that crowd got a little bit going there. And Washington USC, I think that I agree with that too. That's a that's a reputation line. I mean, both teams are four and four. Uh, Washington has lost two games. You know, they outgained uh, Indiana in the game on Saturday. Uh, they outgained Rutgers by a lot in that Friday night game where they gave it away. And so uh, and they, they're undefeated at home as well. But so, uh, they lost the one to the, the Apple Cup. Washington no, they, State. Well, you know what it yeah, was? the one-yard line. It was um, one yard line. And it was actually at the Seahawks Stadium, so it wasn't on campus. No, it, wasn't, it was not on campus. So okay, that's pseudo-home that's game. Why, that's yeah, why. Yeah, pseudo-home okay. game. Okay. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think these two teams are a pick em on a neutral. So you're telling me that, I mean, Southern Cal is 5 6 on neutral? I mm, don't think so. So, And also, we talk about those teams where their goal is gone, all their goals. You have players quit like they did, mm-hmm. red shirt, if you want to call it. That's a convenient way, more honorable term than maybe red uh, uh, quitting. <laughs> but, you know, they've had that. And, boy, what a difference uh, the two guys. This is year three for Lincoln Riley. This is for year one for Fish. Mm. You know, LSU could have been LSU's coach. So, Brian Kelly's not perfect, but he's a lot better, doing a lot better in Baton Rouge than Lincoln Riley is doing in Southern California. So, there he is. Charlie's Picks brought to you by Supreme Rice. You're trying to you, you boil that rice or you're, you got the uh, cooker at home and say, why, why can't I get my rice at that restaurant uh, quality rice? It's easy now. It's the parboil rice. Man, I do it. I boil it at home, strain it. You don't have as much of that residue from the normal rice, and it's a it's a bigger, more firm. It is like just like that rice. I haven't gotten anything, nothing like this close to the restaurant quality rice. It's the parboiled rice. It's the only rice I use right now, and it's now available where you find all of your Supreme Rice products in just about every Baton Rouge area grocery store. And Supreme Rice is a part of Climate Smart Program, talking about reducing methane emissions and preserving water conservation for future generations of Louisiana farmers. For more information, go to the website at SupremeRice.com. We're back with Jimmy's Picks. Log of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris at Edward Jones Investments from Rufino's on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Jimmy Ott's five-pack of picks, brought to you by Supreme Rice. Make sure you use Louisiana rice, grown by Louisiana farmers since 1936. Available at most local grocery stores. Supreme Rice. All right, uh, let's get to it. Three and two, a couple of back-to-back three and two weeks uh, for us here. 24-21 uh, on the season. Baylor and TCU, Dave Aranda on the hot seat, and you wonder how his team would respond to losing that uh, that that. 
Hail Mary up in Boulder. Well, they 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 um they got off to a slow start, fell behind twenty one nothing against BYU, but outplayed BYU the rest of the game, lost by six. It was close. BYU was a little bit more respected loss than at that time. They've gone on to win a couple of games. They routed Texas Tech uh, on the road, uh, and they took care of business by ten against Oklahoma State. The point is, they've re- rebounded very nicely. TCU uh, comes into town. I think Baylor is better. Baylor's at home. Baylor's playing better. This is a short number, in my opinion. I mean, Baylor minus the three. All the reasons that we discussed all day long about Indiana and Michigan State. Man, it was a heck of an effort against Nebraska, the number one team. That was a big letdown spot. But they wouldn't. If game day comes to town. It couldn't be a letdown spot. Would it be a distraction? They wouldn't allow it to be a distraction. They still had some times where they um that it was um, some some struggles up front. Washington might have been just a tad better than up, up front. Signetti's crew ain't got to worry about mental mistakes, dumb plays in this team. They are fundamentally sound, and they play football the right way. Interesting in his conversation on the game day set about his roster compilation, how he put together that thing up in Bloomington. But at some point, come on, man, when he, uh, undefeated in Ohio State uh, on deck, Please, I mean, are around the corner. Michigan State plus a seven and a half. They're capable. Give me a little consistent play. Mm. We'll just be inconsistent like you've been but for most of the season. It is the year of the inconsistent quarterback. Let's see College Station last Saturday night. South Carolina and uh, Texas A&M, how would they handle the uh, the prosperity of their motion? Is an emotional letdown spot for them? And don't think that they're not peeking ahead just a little bit to that final game when Texas comes to town as well. So South Carolina goes in. South Carolina in, in a similar spot when Ole Miss came to town was, boy, they were disappointing to say the least i love how this line has jumped the magic number of three going from two and a half to three and a half lane kiffin thinks it's an advantage uh, at night to play your home games at night oh lsu got another home game <laughs> figures what do you say so shocker shocker was his word guess where you playing saturday night <laughs> cocky let's go cocky prime time cocky stand st- sandstorm let's get it going gamecocks plus three and a half Navy, after, uh, you know, them just ripping and rolling through Evangeline Downs, they brought him up to Del Mar for a spot. It did not work very good. Now he's back down uh, in, at Rice. They just fired their coach back in their proper, uh, their proper um, uh, level. Hey, Navy was un- <laughs> unbelievably bad, and it was a lot of inducive, self-induced things, not created by Notre Dame. It was created, I believe, though, by the stage, which they didn't handle very well uh, at all in uh, in the Meadowlands at MetLife Stadium in New York. So, Navy, are they going to ho- hang their heads? Hell no. Man, they love playing football with their daily regimen. They'll be fine. They'll handle adversity We're just fine. They'll bounce back just fine. And at their proper playing weight, They'll take care of the Rice Owls, minus a 10 and a half there. It's one of my money line picks uh, as well, my money line parlay. And then this one, one of our favorite angles. Uh, rankings aren't good for anything. Minus on-ranked team, favorite over a ranked team. 95, 97% of the time, well, they're at home. It's college sports. It's college basketball. It's college football. This one is not. Row, row, row the boat. P.J. Fleck, I mean, uh, one of our producers, my buddy Alex, is a Minnesota alum. And I got to tell you, would y'all just be happy what you got with uh, P.J. Fleck? You're Minnesota. You're like 5-2. and two. Just, get, just, just just relax, okay? But this one, they go to Bielema and Champaign, Illinois. They're not better than Illinois. I don't know if Illinois is better than Minnesota. But I'm at home catching points. Oh, by the way, Brett Bielema at Illinois and when he was at Wisconsin has owned this team as well. Illinois plus three here. Minnesota, they were in a favorable spot. Maryland had the walk off. I mean the the late win against USC. They stormed the field, coming from about fourteen down in the fourth quarter. They caught them in a favorable spot. They bum rushed them last week. Minnesota had to rally to beat UCLA, where they were statistically dominated. UCLA had a hundred more yards than them in that one. They're not better than Illinois. Give me the home team. Alana 
plus a three at home there. I like uh, – that was my sixth pick. Uh, I, I had them written down. I went back and forth with taking them or Washington. I ended up taking Washington, but I could just as easily have taken Illinois. The only thing that uh, – I, I, I agree with everything you said. The only thing that scared me off a little bit about Illinois was the rush defense. They're near the bottom of the uh, of the Big Ten in rush defense, which you don't expect from a Bielema team. But Minnesota doesn't run the football all that well either. They're 16th, I think. Out of, well, no, that's 18th. 17th. Uh, I think in rush offense in the league, so like that one, like the Navy pick. Uh, I'm with you on South Carolina. I guess I'm the only. I, I wrote down Michigan State too. Um, I, I guess I, I I will be on them tomorrow. I just didn't put them in my five pack. I like that one. And uh, Baylor, I, I don't I don't know. Um, been a little back and forth on uh, on Dave Aranda's group this year, so I hope you catch him on the uh, hope you catch him on I the think right playing day. well. Yeah, I think yeah. they're playing well. And look, man, this how would their their and, record could be and, and easily a lot, a couple of games better. back to back turnovers to start yeah. the BYU game. I mean, they could, right. they could have won that one. They're probably better. They just got all dug themselves too big of a hole against a a solid team. But you know, what do we think of BYU now? And then Colorado, Colorado, BYU's top the Big, big Twelve. Colorado's in second. And yeah. I mean, they, you know, they they should have beat them. You know, out there, I think they're better. Than than their their uh, overall record and yeah, then no, they could easily be six and two yeah easily. yeah so I mean they um I I, I like the way uh, they've rebounded uh, in that one so don't forget our friends at Loft and Staffing Services Loft and Staffing Services. hey how about uh, they bring you Otter Locks each and every evening at five fifty on uh, after further review with Moscona and lay another uh, Otter Lock win last night with the New York Jets right after a little bit of a a double uh, Jacksonville State. Uh, winner and uh, along with um, along with the Dodgers, so we won our last three. My buddy uh, Bart Lofton over at uh, Lofton Staffing Services, second generation staffing services, and we match hard workers with the most sought after employers at Lofton. You're more than just another employee. We care about your interests and we'll match with a company that needs your skills. Call us today nine two four zero two hundred or go to Lofton dot jobs. That's right, Lofton dot jobs. You can. Do that in the comfort of your own home. Lofton Staffing Services, we've been putting people to work since 1979. 924-0200 and Lofton.jobs. Live at Rafino's. Caboose is next. Uh, what, what, yeah. Caboose is hot, huh? Yeah, 4 on one last week. <laughs> Lock, on. Lock of the Week little, Friday man. presented by Tex Marshall. Come on, weather, Jones man. Investments, 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Lock of the Week Friday, presented by Tex Morris of Edward Jones Investments. Now, back to Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Well, Max, you just missed a perfect week by a point. Yeah. 4 0 oh, 1 last week. Who cost you the, the perfect? Wake Forest was uh, laying three. They won by three. Uh, they actually had a chance to win that game by double digits pretty easily, but they let Stanford hang around. So, uh, But we'll take, the, we'll take the week. I needed it. I needed it. Yeah. Sure. Four, all right. 4 0 oh, 1, 22 22 and 1 for the season. Let's get it. Going to start off in the 11 a.m. slate with a total. I'm going to take Ole Miss Arkansas under 54 in that one. Uh, here's here's the big thing. I was in I was ki- kind of inclined like you, Charlie, to take Arkansas, but Jaquin and Jackson ruled out for this game. They're starting running back. I think it's a real problem for their offense. The way that they let Taylor Green run, I think it's very much dependent on Jackson being in the game, which he will not be this week. Also, we we know that you know Trey Harris hasn't quite been the same. He's questionable, but still going to be dealing with an injury. Ole Miss has gone under in seven straight games. They're an under team. Jimmy, you saw this in the Oklahoma game. The offense just seemed very, mm-hmm. very, very happy to just see the game out you with a win. He, he, he does not have these wide open chunk plays. They're 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 more deliberate in their pace, and they're just more of a complete team. And I mean, he's just no, they're, they're, we know that defensively up front, my gosh, they're way better than they normally been on the road in a tough environment as well. I just don't see many points in this game, so I'll take the under fifty four. Old Miss in Arkansas. That's Minchie. I'm like, where's a haunted house for us in Tateville? <laughs> I'm not angry anymore. I'm just disappointed. I think this is sweet. Runs, I read about halftime last Runs week. in a little spot before mm-hmm. Big You know they're looking ahead to Georgia. Sure. You know it. Wouldn't it be just like them to lose this game and then beat Georgia next week? 
I'm telling you, they, they have a tough time. I'll look it up. Go ahead, Max. Unfortunately, another, a move against me here. I was getting 10. I'm now only getting 9.5 with Stanford on the road at NC State. Well, you, NC got, you, get, you got onions picking them. Go ahead. NC State's <laughs> a team that you just can't bet. They're unbettable. 1-7 against the spread. I've been fading them a lot this year. They did win and cover against Cal on the road. Uh, that was it was a decent win. They showed a little bit of life. They're off a of bye week. But I just can't lay – lay over a touchdown with NC State against anyone. I mean, they beat La Tech, who's terrible, by 10. They beat Northern Illinois by 7, who's been shown as a fraud after beating Notre Dame. They're just not good. And Stanford, for what it's worth, they I watched them a good bit against Wake. They covered that number. They have some life about them. You know, they, they can move the ball a little bit offensively. They had a really tough schedule before then. So I think Stanford's going to stay in this game. I'll take the 9.5 points with the, uh, with the Cardinal. Next game, I'm going to go to the world's largest outdoor, outdoor cocktail party, no matter if they want to call it that or not. I'm going to take Florida as well here, Charlie, 14 and a half here. Uh, I know it was 18 and a half when this thing opened, but I think Florida's the right side. They're probably, by a power rankings perspective, a top 25 team. They've covered four in a row. They're playing a lot better. Lagway is very much – there's a lot of – uh, variability with him, you, you, boom or bust, so you could worry a little bit about him. But Carson Beck, in his last five SEC games, eight touchdowns, eight interceptions. Like, congrats, you're dating a Cavender twin, but I, I'm not seeing this. <laughs> NFL. <laughs> one of the Cavender twins? Go ahead. I, I'm not seeing this number one you know, possible quarterback from him. Uh, he's uh, not. It, it, it's, it's a problem, and their offense just isn't quite the same if he's not clicking on all cylinders. Florida's going to be ready for this game. I, I think Florida's going to win one or two of their, these games down the stretch, and that's not a, just including the Florida State game. Florida's got some life in them, and you know they're going to upset. I'm going to be playing them a lot lately, but 14 and a half in a rivalry game, I'll gladly take it. Napier has been very good as a double-digit dog as well I in his career. Napier. South Carolina plus three and a half against Texas A&M with you on this one as well, Charlie. This is just a letdown spot, and we've seen A&M in some bad spots on their schedule kind of struggle. Bowling Green, after a win against Florida, they were 21-point favorites, one by six. We saw going into that LSU game, they went on the road to Starkville, laying 21, happy to get out there with a win by 10. Of course, they're only laying three and a half in this one, but South Carolina is ready to go, and you could be looking at this team a lot differently had they been able to beat LSU, had they been able to beat Alabama, which they absolutely could have done. They'd only have one loss to Ole Miss, if that were the case. Uh, this is a tough place to play. They're catching three and a half now, so I'll take it with the Gamecocks. And finally, Iowa minus two and a half against Wisconsin. Thought about the over in this one. Iowa actually 7-1 to the over. this big over year. team this year. They're playing offense a lot better, and what's interesting here is they're going to a different quarterback. Brendan Sullivan replaces Cade McNamara, who hasn't been as good. He got concussed last week. Sullivan's going to get the start. More of a dual-threat quarterback. 41 rushing yards uh, along with his uh, passing game last year. Last week, he came in the second quarter. They scored 37 points in two quarters uh, right out the gates and then kind of mailed it in the fourth quarter against Northwestern last week. So I think he expands this offense a little bit. Wisconsin plays at a pretty good tempo as well, so Iowa does slow it down, but uh, it'll be countered by Wisconsin, who Braden Locke, they, they can score the ball a little bit. I, I see points in this one. I, I'm inclined to take the over, but I, I just think Iowa, with this new quarterback, is actually going to be benefited here. They, they blow out Washington, who's got a pretty good defense. Wisconsin's defense I don't really trust. They did a lot of their good numbers against really bad offenses. So I'm going to lay the two and a half with Iowa at home. To me, they're a better team in general, but at home now they should be laying five or six in my opinion. Who's the picks again? Recap them real quick. Uh, Ole Miss, Arkansas under 54, Stanford plus 9.5 at NC State, Florida plus 14.5 against Georgia, South Carolina plus 3.5 against Hold on, man. I mean, you think I can write that fast? Stanford, Never. and then who else? Florida plus 14.5. Okay. South Carolina plus 3.5 against A&M. And plus then my three and ball, you're jumping on me and Charlie's bandwagon. Here sure you go, am. Charlie. You think they're going to play in, uh, in Little Rock anymore? <laughs> Last two times they played in Little Rock, Ole Miss beat Arkansas. They played in Fayetteville. They have lost their last five in eight of their last nine. Yeah, I think they're down to playing just uh, the, non-conference, the non-conference rental wins in Little Rock. I think it's all they play there. Mincy, Ar- Fayetteville, boo. <laughs> Even in Oxford, though, Jimmy, uh, Arkansas covered nine of ten. 
in this series. So they always tend to play Ole Miss close, even if they don't win. They played that crazy game when the, the, the uh, LSU was in Kentucky. Yeah, like 50 to 20, 49, uh, 20, 20, 53 20, to 52. 2021, 50 right? 51 yeah. and 21, yep. Oh, wait, wait they had a 53-52 in, uh, in 2015 also. Mm-hmm. That was uh, in Oxford. Yeah, the, yeah that was that was. Let's when, go when, with an under this time. Yeah. <laughs> Which didn't. Um, well, no, the the one that you're talking about, Ole Miss one, that was um, 2021. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the one, uh, the other one, um, the uh, in uh, 2015, Arkansas won that one uh, by one. I think that was some overtime. So. Thanks, to everybody, for participating We're at Beau Ravage today. this weekend on the uh, Football Sunday. We start that at 10 o'clock, and we'll be there for the Monday show as well. For Max, for Jimmy Jordan back in the studio, I'm Charles Hanniger saying thank you and good afternoon. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay tuned for Hunt Palmer on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge.